This happened to me a couple of years back. Not sure exactly how long ago now. Time gets muddled after trauma like that. It all started with this road trip my buddy Ari and I planned, right after finishing grad school. The whole, explore the country, thing before real life kicked in. It was his idea to rent an RV, figured it'd be cheaper than motels. I'm more of a tent kind of guy myself, but hey, adventure, right? We ended up heading through Wyoming, drawn to the wide-open landscapes and those epic national parks. Drove for what felt like ages, passing one-horse towns with quirky names and gas stations that looked straight out of the 60s. Eventually, Ari suggested we find a more remote spot, off the main roads. And wouldn't you know it, we stumbled upon this dirt track near Wind River Indian Reservation that seemed perfect. Thick pines, towering above us, dappled light filtering through, a creek nearby picture postcard worthy, at least on the surface. We pulled in, and that was the beginning of everything. I like to explore, always have. Ari, on the other hand, he's content to kick back with a beer by the fire. So, I wandered the trees a bit that first afternoon, checking out our newly claimed camping territory. There was an eerily silent quality to the place. Maybe I was just hyper-aware because we were so isolated. It nagged at the back of my mind, something I attributed to being used to more, well, people, I guess. Anyway, I stumbled onto this weird scene, an old mining claim. Like way, way old. There was even a partially collapsed mining shed, wood rotting, walls caving in. Probably would have moved on, but a bit of twisted metal stuck out, catching the fading light. Went through some scattered debris rusty gears, old lantern glass, nothing exciting. The shed itself gave me the willies, so I made quick work of inspecting it. One wall creaked ominously as I stepped out, like it held its breath the whole time I was in there. Didn't linger to imagine whatever else might be lurking within. Back at camp, with the fire now dancing against the gathering dusk, Ari didn't miss a beat in teasing me about my mining obsession. It's kind of our shtick, he takes jabs. I don't bite back. The usual. Gonna strike it rich, are ya, Ethan? Type banter. Truth was, something seemed off with that mining claim. Something I couldn't put my finger on. Night fell thick and fast and we settled into our sleeping bags, more exhausted by the day's drive than I wanted to admit. We did some half-hearted chatting, but even in the dim glow I could see Ari nodding off. Sleep hit me fast, too. Then, I woke up with a sense of dread that pricked every hair on my neck. I listened for a moment, and my heart leapt someone was moving around on the ground outside our RV. No whispers, just muffled footsteps, and then, a chilling crunch and drag under the weight of a body. Ari was still out cold. I lay there paralyzed by fear. Could just be some curious animal. Raccoons get brave this far from towns but a human-sized crunch? This place, the old claim, all of it just radiated bad vibes. I had to check. Creeping over to the RV window. I peered out and my blood ran cold. A tall gaunt figure stood a few yards away, wore worn work clothes and had stringy gray hair hanging from under a beat-up baseball cap obscuring most of his face. Saw what he dragged through the dirt. It was Ari. I choked back a scream. There was the glint of steel, a machete of some kind, in the stranger's hand, moonlight playing on blood-stained metal. Ari wasn't just unconscious, he was dead. He'd never even woken up. There was nothing I could do but run. I burst out the other side of the RV and straight into the woods. I kept running, crashing through underbrush, dodging shadows, fear twisting me up inside. I heard nothing behind me, but I knew that figure was watching. He must have lived out here 
some recluse turned killer. He knew those woods better than I ever could. His silence and knowledge gave him the ultimate advantage. I stumbled on for what felt like hours, but it was dark out there with just a sliver of a moon. Time melted away. The only reality was terror. Eventually I came out near a road where a lucky trucker spotted me, dirty and wild-eyed. He took me to the nearest ranger station. Law enforcement found the RV, but no trace of Ari and no trace of his killer either. They talked about me as a trauma survivor. Some of them whispered I might have made up the whole thing, but that mine, the blood, they weren't imaginary. Even after years have passed, that primal dread creeps up during quiet nights. I always sleep with the lights on now and make sure I'm never too isolated. That guy is still out there. And some part of me believes he may never stop hunting. This happened a few years ago. It was supposed to be the ultimate road trip me, Ezra, and a beat-up old camper van we scored cheap. Ezra and I have been buddies since middle school, always dreaming of hitting the open road after finishing college. But sometimes, life's funny when it kicks your expectations down a dirt track into oblivion. We rolled through Idaho, aiming for those big sky, empty spaces, you know the type. Pulled off towards Sawtooth National Forest, drawn by the jagged mountain views and promise of quiet woods. Found a spot right near a bubbling creek, not another soul in sight. Paradise at first glance. Only a few hours in, I should have noticed the silence of the place no birds, no breeze rustling leaves, just stillness. Looking back, that should have been the first red flag. But when you're young and thinking yourself invincible, sometimes intuition whispers when it should damn well yell. After sunset, Ezra wanted to crack open a few beers around the fire. Standard camping stuff. It's funny now, I guess, to think it all started so casual. I noticed a half-buried rock near the fire pit, and curiosity, always been my downfall, got the better of me. Started digging and unearthed what looked like a rusty old trap, kind used for fur back in the pioneer days. Creepy, yeah but something about it felt different. Showed it to Ezra, but he couldn't have cared less, busy regaling me with some epic city escape tale as usual. I kept fiddling with the thing, a compulsion building up inside me. Ezra called me obsessed, laughing. We had that typical back-and-forth thing going on. Maybe he was right, but hey, a bit of an explorer spirit never hurt anyone. Or so I thought. He eventually drifted off, and the dying fire left just those dancing shadows creeping along the edge of our clearing. You ever sit alone near a wilderness campfire at night? It's something eerie about it, something primal. Something in that old trap started rattling like clockwork in my hands. And that's when I heard the footsteps snap a twig somewhere deep in the woods. Ezra slept on. No clue that every nerve in my body screamed danger. It came again, crunch of heavy boots. Panic flared up, mixed with cold, logical calculation. The RV was my one shot at escape. Lunge for it, fumbling with the door, too slow. A massive hand closed over my shoulder, wrenching me backward. He was tall, gaunt like he'd spent his life bent beneath the weight of too hard labor. Old minor clothes hung loose on his frame, worn face hidden in shadow. Had that wildness some men get when they lived too far from anything resembling society. An axe hung slack in his other hand, moonlight catching the chip steel. Then a whisper, raspy like he hadn't spoken in years. This my land. What's mine is mine. Terror cut my breathing short, but with it came a burst of desperate rage. 
elbow smashed back into his ribs, forcing a surprise grunt out of him. That flicker of weakness was all I needed. Dove and Rolled broke free into the trees. Ran like the devil was on my tail, which honestly wasn't that far off the mark. Trees blurred together, heart trying to hammer out of my chest. He didn't yell, didn't speak, nothing but the steady crunch of those damn footsteps keeping pace. Like a predator toying with its prey. Finally, my path veered into thick undergrowth near the creek. That's when I stumbled on them. Campers couple in their mid-forties, judging by the fancy gear. Should have felt some relief, the first sign of normal folks in ours. Instead, just more horror. They lay side by side in their sleeping bags, throats gaping in ragged slashes. My stomach heaved, no blood, none at all. That man-man must have drained them to lessen the mess. It's an image carved into my soul even now. He knew their screams wouldn't carry this far, had this whole ritual perfected. Back into those suffocating woods I ran. Every snap twig sounded like gunfire. Every flicker of firelight was him closing in. I finally came out by a logging road, where, by some crazy luck, two college kids on a late-night drive spotted me. Wild-eyed, covered in scratches, you can imagine the story I threw at them. Back at the ranger station, the police weren't fully buying it. Small-town cops always seemed skeptical of outsiders. The bodies they did find, couple, axe wounds, looked too clean-cut, no sign of some unhinged mountain man lurking about. The old trap thing just got tossed. The RV was empty, no Ezra. That was the worst part. They looked at me, some unspoken doubt in their eyes. Never went back for what they couldn't find. And never saw his face, just that shadowed outline beneath a faded ball cap. Some nights, I think I might have just dreamt it. Then the phantom ache settles into my shoulder where his grip dug in, and I know damn well it was real. The others got graves at least. Ezra? Out there somewhere, maybe the ground swallowed his bones for good. And somewhere amongst those trees, that madman is living off whatever sick rituals he's built in the silence. Sometimes, a little adventure is way more than you bargained for. Or survived. This happened to me back when I was just a kid. Maybe ten, eleven years old. That blurry summer between being just a kid and the whole messiness of teenage years looming ahead. Me and my family used to go camping by Lake Wenatchee, Washington State. Those mountains, tall pines, that water so clear you could see fish sipping under your toes. You wouldn't imagine anything bad could happen in a place like that. Turns out, bad isn't picky about picturesque scenery. Back then, my whole world was bikes with my buddy, Devin, or helping with gardening at our house. That particular summer, the camping trip was the big highlight I circled on my calendar. Packed up the usual stuff, piled into our dad's old truck, and off we went, me, sis, always annoying twelve-year-old Maya, and my parents. Dad's an accountant. Mom teaches at the local high school. Normal suburban folk, not survivalists or outdoors experts. That probably should have been a sign. Our RV campsite was in a decent spot, not too far from other groups. But a trail through the forest behind us held this pull for me, that promise of exploring new ground and feeling just a bit grown up and independent. Parents always nagged about sticking close, the usual, buddy system, lecture I tuned out long ago. Devin, now there was a kindred spirit. No fear in him, always off on some mini-adventure. It rubbed off on me a bit, or maybe was always there waiting for an excuse. 
Second day, I wandered farther than ever before. Path just kept beckoning. Forests got thicker, dappled light and quiet pressing in from all sides. That weird thrill you get, part excited, part maybe a little nervous, good to feel some of that instead of mindlessly watching cartoons. Found a spot where an old logging truck had toppled on its side, vines creeping between the busted windows. This just screamed pirate ship in my kid head, had to climb on. Clambering and jumping and imagining buried treasure, well, I slipped. Smacked my ankle hard, sharp pain exploding up my leg. Limped along, trying to play it down, like, no problem, just a scratch. Finally realized my ankle was swelling and turning a funny color. Okay, now the worry settled in, had to make my way back. That's when I heard the scream. High-pitched, cut off suddenly. Figured it was just another camper playing games at first. Then, another, same, choked off, but there was something just wrong about it. Animal wouldn't sound like that, not right. Stood there frozen, ankle throbbing in time with my pulse. Something about those noises sent shivers up my spine. Took off limping back down the trail. It seemed every twist, every glimpse between the trees held some lurking threat. Came out back at our campsite, breath short, chest burning. Didn't see a soul. Thought maybe it was my imagination playing tricks. Maya didn't even look up from her stupid teen magazines long enough to give me grief. Mom, making sandwiches, was the first to spot my swollen ankle. One look, and all that usual mom calm turned to worry. Dad started peppering me with questions. Where, when, did I see anyone? They couldn't get through that forest fast enough, me hobbling in tow. By then... A park ranger truck stood beside the campsite. Ranger looked grim, the lines on his face etched deep. My heart beat so fast I thought it'd leave my body. Turns out, there was a reason for the empty clearing. Some hikers hadn't come back that morning. Dad kept repeating my story about the screams, his eyes flicking around like something dangerous was still close. The search didn't find the hikers that day, and the way the sun was dipping told me they'd call it off soon. My ankle was barely on my mind now. At dinner, under the pale glow of the battery-powered lamp, I could see the unspoken concern between my parents. Ranger had talked about wild animals, accidents, that stuff adults used to calm themselves down. In the shadows... Every sound echoed a bit too loud. The wind through the trees sounded almost like ragged breathing. Something just fell off. It always does in those stories the older kids whisper around the campfire, right? But what if those whisperings aren't just for thrills? I didn't sleep at all that night. By dawn, search teams were out in full force. Dad joined them. Mom insisted on staying with us kids at the camper. Maya barely lifted her nose out of her book, so bored by the whole thing. Me, I couldn't tear my eyes from the edge of the clearing. And that's when I saw him. Standing on the far side of the trail, tall and lean, faded denim overalls hiding wiry strength. Dirt was stained under his nails, and what I later learned were blood flecks dotted his clothes. No way to see his face, the shadow from his worn baseball cap obscuring everything. My stomach clenched there was a wrongness about how he stood, watching, waiting. And he held, an axe. Voice caught in my throat, but Mom didn't hear me at first. Ranger truck pulled up, and her focus fell on that. I wanted to scream, but something primal told me silence was my only strategy. He stood there, the stillness chilling me to the bone. No sound, no motion, just that heavy presence lingering by the trail where the screams came from. Don't know how long passed. 
Dad came striding into view, and the figure disappeared with impossible speed into the undergrowth. I saw blood stains on his hands, the smear on his cheek. Ranger and Dad spoke quietly, voices too far to make out. But it didn't take a translator to understand the dread and tension thickening the air. That day, they found the couple, bodies torn open, throats slashed. We packed up in near silence, Mom holding Maya by the shoulder, an almost protective gesture. Dad's brow was creased, not from the effort of packing, but from worry. Nobody said it, but we all felt that there was something still lurking in those woods. They never caught whoever did that, some drifter, maybe some mountain survivalist gone wrong. And me? Part of me wants to say I dreamed the whole thing, the figure, the axe. Sometimes, under city street lights and surrounded by concrete and steel, it seems a world away. But my ankle bears the crooked twist from that fall, a reminder. And if, on a quiet night, the wind rustles just so, sometimes I hear those screams, and feel his eyes fixed upon me in the shadows. This happened to me a few years back. Makes me chuckle now, not because of what happened, that still sends shivers down my spine, but because of what a skeptical idiot I was before it. See, I've always prided myself on being practical, down-to-earth, someone who isn't swayed by ghost stories and creepy campfire tales. Funny how life knocks that arrogance right out of you. My name's Derek, by the way. Mid-thirties, outdoors-ish, more a hiking enthusiast than a full-blown survivalist. Back then, I was into this kick of trying RV life after seeing all those folks gushing about it online. Figured it would be a neat way to work remotely and see some different national parks. So, there I was, driving along the scenic state highway in Arizona. Can't say the exact place. Wouldn't want you folks running off getting yourselves into the same mess I did. It was beautiful country, though, those red rock formations rising out of the desert, the whole Wild West vibe. I'd found a quiet little pull-off with stunning views, just me and the wilderness. Paradise, as far as I was concerned. That first evening, nothing weird. I cracked open a beer, grilled some dinner, relaxed at the little RV's table. You know those travel brochures that go on about endless starry nights? I was living that cliché, and loving every damned second. I stayed up late, staring out, letting the silence and solitude settle over me. This kind of peace, you only get it way out from civilization. Maybe that's the first mistake I made. Believing I was truly alone. Next morning, I woke up, made coffee, the whole cozy RV routine. I decided to do a short hike before getting down to work. There was a trail winding up from the highway, and the view promised to be even better than from the campground. Off I set, feeling adventurous, my backpack light. About half a mile up, things took a bizarre turn. There it was, smack in the middle of the path, a pile of coyote bones. Now, animals die, it's nature. But this, it was meticulously arranged. Ribs all lined up, the skull staring off down the trail like a little skeletal guardian. No bite marks, no sign of a struggle. It looked like they had just collapsed into this perfect creepy display. My city slicker mind balked. Maybe some weird kid did this. I mumbled to myself poking it with my hiking stick. That felt off. I was in the wilderness, middle of nowhere, and someone's bored child is out here building horror movie props. Didn't add up. But determined not to let this ruin my hike, I pushed it out of mind and moved on. Hours later, back at the RV, I still couldn't shake it. Every crack of a twig, 
Every rustle had me on edge. Was someone watching me? It was stupid, that primal sense of unease, but it wouldn't let go. That night sleep was restless. Every shadow danced with menace. Every whisper of wind carried some imagined threat. And I started hearing something else. Faint, distant scratching. Coming from outside. I froze. It sounded like nails on the RV door. Just as the sound was fading, I gathered the courage to peek out a window. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Nerves getting the better of you, Derek. I snorted at myself, but the adrenaline wouldn't go away. It wasn't like there were bears this far south, but you'd hear horror stories. People alone in the woods, never being seen again. What if this was it? This quiet spot would be the perfect place to get rid of some nosy arvier, and no one would have a clue until my rig got found years later. By morning, I was laughing at myself. Of course there wasn't anyone waiting to eat me. Had to be wind on the branches, whatever. Yet something had changed. Every noise set me on high alert. I was no longer out for a relaxing getaway I was in survival mode. That instinct probably saved my life. This happened a few years ago, back when I was younger and I reckon a bit dumber. Life had that open book quality, every page just waiting to be written. So... When my buddy Kyler suggested a cross-country camping trip in his clapped-out RV, it sounded like a chapter just begging for action. I'm Rory, by the way, city kid raised, more a fan of indoor plumbing than outhouses and starlight. This whole trip promised to be an experience, but not quite in the way it turned out. We headed for Utah, that red rock wilderness. Zion National Park, yeah. It's as postcard perfect as it sounds. But Kyler? He's one of those who needs to take the road less traveled, gotta see things no typical tourist spots. So he pulls this map out, pointing at some forgotten track way off in the middle of the backcountry, Cane Gulch. I'm all for seeing new things, but remote was starting to take on a sinister edge the closer we got to that desolate red dirt turning toward night. We found a flat spot to pull off, and that's when I first saw it. Way off in the distance, there was this faint shimmer atop a ridge overlooking our sight. Not the regular twinkling of stars, but something brighter, larger. Curiosity battled some inner alarm bell. But you know those times when logic takes a back seat to sheer dumb bravado? This qualified. That shimmer pulsed, like a beacon that seemed to focus right on us. Kyler was already hyped up, calling it some weird mirage effect, a reflection playing tricks in the darkness. We shoulda got the hell out of there then, shoulda listened to the prickle on the back of my neck. Now, we weren't those fancy camping types with all the high-tech gear. Just a tent, sleeping bags, a propane stove, that sort of setup. It's what makes it funnier in a sad kind of way, when I later tried to describe what happened. See, sometime around midnight, I woke up with a jolt. Not jump scare jump. This was different, felt like some invisible force yanked me awake. There was this humming, not in your ears, more like a vibration in your bones. And that light again, now way brighter, casting a cold glow over the RV. Then, footsteps. Not from any regular person, these sounded too heavy, too solid. You've heard folks claim panic freezes you solid? It's true. I lay there, heart pounding hard enough to shake the ground while some part of me still screamed BS. My rational mind tried to explain it away. Animal noises, some weird moonlight playing tricks, anything. But there was no hiding from the way those footsteps circled the RV, 
pausing for just a second each time they rounded my side. The tent didn't feel like much protection against whatever was making that racket. They didn't sound hurried, these footsteps. Had a measured purpose to them. I held my breath, then felt. Well, felt might not be the word. It was like some presence pressed against the tent right near my head, like studying me. An oppressive weight settled on my chest, making it hard to draw a proper breath. Then, it moved on. And that humming faded, the light on the ridge blinked out and I lay there shivering as if plunged in ice. Finally, I managed to stumble out. The flashlight didn't do a lot in the thick darkness. RV looked untouched, no strange markings or nothing. The next day, I figured there wouldn't be tracks in the hard ground anyway. We argued. I wanted the hell out of there. And that was totally me admitting, even halfway. Something real spooky had happened. But for all his adventurous talk, Kyler got stubborn. Didn't like being bested by some dumb desert noises. I should have walked, left his dumb ass by the side of the road, but there was still some lingering doubt that made me hang back. Maybe I didn't need proof to keep my sanity or something. And that's when he showed up. There were caves higher up on the ridge. Old sandstone overhangs cut into the rock. Kyler wanted to explore. Seemed reasonable in the harsh daylight, the night's fear already blurring around the edges. Found some crude hand tools up there, like some long-gone folks once lived out those holes. Kyler was going on about pioneer survival stuff, but when he turned his back, that's when I noticed something carved deep into the cave wall. Hard to make out, the lines etched rough-like, faded with time. It looked like the silhouette of a figure, tall, limbs almost stretched impossibly long. But that wasn't the chilling part. It had glowing eyes cut into the stone, and what could only be a twisted grin slashed in the place of a mouth. And I got this awful sense, like it was watching us, pleased we found it. Even then... A part of me didn't want to accept it. There's an old-timer diner a few hours' drive out from that spot. That was my salvation. Got enough signal on my phone to lie with such conviction even I almost believed it Dad got into an accident. Need to get back ASAP. Kyler swore and moaned, but thankfully drove to that greasy spoon where I booked it home on the first Greyhound heading east. I heard some time after that an old rancher's sheep went missing up there in Cane Gulch. No one said what might have taken them, but I saw enough. Later, nights when sleep won't come, I sometimes swear I feel that humming, that pressing sense right outside the window. But city walls feel just that bit stronger against whatever nameless thing stalk that desert. Even when Kyler called, said some other hiker stumbled across that carving I saw, said something felt so wrong he hightailed it out of there, even with proof, with validation, something about it keeps me rooted firmly indoors. Some experiences scar you deeper than anyone with their eyes and words can fully understand. Maybe, just maybe, some mysteries are best left unsolved, the price of staying sane too high. This happened to me a few years back. Was one of those moments you realize how easy it is for all your plans, all your little certainties, to go sideways real fast. I'm Vance, by the way. Average office worker with a bad case of wanderlust. RV living seemed like a temporary solution. Work remotely, see some different scenery. Figured that even if it got old, there wasn't too much risk compared to selling everything off for some van build. My first taste of living wild was along the Oregon coast. One of those redwood forest campsites nestled right alongside the beach. Perfect mix of woodsy pine smell and the ocean spray. Paradise at first. 
Now, there's something about those enormous trees that messes with your sense of place and time. Makes you feel both powerful and insignificant all at once. It got to me more than I would care to admit back then. So, it's one early morning that things go wrong. It started with a sound you just don't hear on a campsite, a truck engine growling to life deep in the trees. Now, it could have been park workers or anyone using one of the backcountry trails. No reason to panic, but it put me on edge. There's always that slight worry, being so isolated, a breakdown means no quick fix. But this didn't feel like that. You ever got that off feeling about a place? I got that, big time. Something was watching me, and it didn't seem friendly. I go out for a walk to clear my head and that's when I find it. Someone, not sure you could call whatever did this human, had trashed a camp spot nearby. Not talking messy trash either. More like someone went full rage mode. Sleeping bag torn to shreds, cookware smashed flat, food smeared all over the picnic table. Looked like the work of a wild animal, except none of that food was actually eaten. This looked deliberate, spiteful. At this point, the logical side of the brain is still battling it out with the primal side yelling I should probably be getting the hell out of there. My curiosity wins, a bad move in hindsight. Maybe some drifter who'd finally snapped. Could be dangerous still. I get back to my RV, quietly grab my shotgun. Just in case. Then it's time to play detective. Turns out there's a trail that connects some of the campsites further into the woods. Not marked on maps, probably an animal path people use sometimes. Following it wasn't too difficult, with the occasional smashed piece of camping gear acting as a creepy signpost. That leads me to another destroyed site, even worse than the first, and that's when it hits me. This isn't some rage quit. There's a method to it. Campsites getting further apart. It's almost like whoever's responsible is leading someone, or maybe driving them out. This wasn't some animal attack, that much was sure. The destruction just felt too staged, like some twisted sort of performance for an audience that wasn't there. Back at the RV, now that full-blown panic sets in. Every crack and creak of the branches sounds like someone creeping up outside. No phone service, of course. Nearest town's over an hour drive on good roads starting to wonder if I'm the next target. You don't take down tents all neat and careful then arrange smashed up chairs in a line unless you're sending a message. This was about territory, about claiming those woods, and anyone stupid enough to stay after those markers were down was fair game. There's a flash of movement through the trees and my fingers find the trigger. Just a squirrel, but my nerves feel shot. This isn't my world. I grab my phone and keys, figure my biggest enemy now is whatever freaks out there seeing my RV parked all alone at night. Now it's a race. Getting out of there before sundown. Every sound echoes around me like some sicko is stalking me, watching me break down. It ain't easy with those massive trees blocking most of the light, even in the afternoon. It feels like trying to drive through a haunted house every shadow has a face. Finally, hit the main road. There's no relief, just more dread. You see an isolated truck pulled off the side, and your mind makes it into a killer's waiting spot. Each set of headlights has you wondering if whoever's been tearing through the woods all day is now after you. I'm ready to go full paranoid here ready to ram any car that slows down or follows me. Reaching the nearest town is like being born again. I pull into a gas station bright enough to feel safe and find myself staring at the clerk like he's my life preserver. Took every ounce of willpower not to blurt out my whole crazy story. Instead, I managed to ask some casual questions, 
if there'd been any trouble about anyone weird reported hanging around lately. Dude shrugs, but then mentions there have been rumors of hikers going missing up near those redwoods. Nothing on the news, only folks who frequent those trails seem to whisper about it. He even drops a phrase that sticks with me. Something ain't right there. I end up calling a tow truck, claims something busted in the RV's engine and needs serious repair. Figure it's best to make it seem less like I'm running, and more like my trip got cut short. I don't even argue the price. Guy comes out, hooks up the RV, and takes it to the nearest garage. Meanwhile, I'm scanning the whole damn lot, sure that the second he tows me away, whoever's in those woods will know exactly where I went. I left that RV right there with my laptop and camera gear inside. Yeah, a loss, but a small price to pay to just disappear completely. For all I know, whatever was at those campsites got what it wanted, a place all to itself. This happened to me a couple of years ago. Wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. Not that I talk about it much. You sound crazy real quick once you do. My name's Lucas, by the way. Outdoors guy. Always have been. Hunting, fishing, camping. It's where I feel most alive. Maybe that's why this whole thing felt like such a violation, being outwitted in my own territory. This particular trip, I was hitting up Yellowstone National Park for a solo elk hunting season. Not the wilderness experience folks imagine, but more a test of patience and logistics. Got myself a spot on one of the campgrounds along the park's eastern edge in Wyoming. Nice setup. My RV parked among the pines with that breathtaking Teton Range view that makes all the crowds and traffic worth it. A couple of days in, nothing much to report. The elk hadn't been moving like I'd hoped. So, while waiting for better intel, I decide to do some hiking. There's this trail I'd seen, not officially marked, but a clear path winding into the backcountry. I like those, less chance of running into some clueless tourist. Off I go, rifle slung just getting back to basics and soaking in the fresh air. Then I found it. Not an elk, but a gut pile. Now, hunters leave these, the entrails and such after a successful field dressing. Common practice, scavengers have at it. What made this one weird was the location. Deep in the woods, not your typical hunting spot. Also, it was tidy. I'm not easily squeamish, but this got to me. The guts were laid out carefully, no sign of animal tearing into them. Plus, a single bleached deer jawbone sat right in the center of it all. It felt less like leftovers and more like some kind of display. My internal alarm is starting to buzz. It doesn't feel like some other hunter just doing a sloppy job. My city buddy'd give me crap for this, but the woods felt wrong. Like I shouldn't be there. My hand tightens on the rifle, and I decide to backtrack. Stupid probably, gotta check things out, but there was a primal gut instinct I couldn't shake. Back at camp, it still bugs me. I find myself glancing over my shoulder every few minutes, checking the surrounding trees. Maybe the gut pile had nothing to do with anything, but that sense of unease lingers. Then night falls, and that's when things get truly bizarre. I'm woken by a crash. Sits me straight up. I grab my rifle and peer out the RV's window. I see nothing, the night's silent. Probably a bear rummaging through the bins. I try to assure myself. Then it happens again louder this time. Suddenly, I realize, it isn't just any crash. There's a rhythm to it, almost like a pounding. Someone or something is hitting my RV. Then it stops. 
My breath hitches in my throat. My fingers brush the cold metal of the rifle. This ain't natural. Something's out there, something intelligent. My phone. Its weak signal can't get a call out in this part of the woods. Now, rational folks might assume someone in camp needed help, had maybe gotten hurt. But my mind doesn't go there. The pounding had malice to it, and that gut pal comes screaming back to my mind. Something is out there, something that understands, something that knows I'm alone. After what feels like hours, the silence breaks again. This time it's the sound of footsteps. Heavy footsteps, circling the RV. They stop beside the driver's door. I can practically picture the hand poised there. The fear feels hot under my skin. They move on, and then, an earth-shaking slam against the back of the RV nearly throws me off my feet. I know without a doubt, if whoever is out there wanted in, those thin RV walls wouldn't hold. Suddenly, a scraping. It's coming from underneath. I freeze, the image of those bleached bones clear in my head. Was there something crawling beneath me right now? Then the scraping moves upwards, along the side of the RV, slowly, unhurriedly. Like whoever's out there enjoys this. Enjoys seeing the effect they're having. It hits me that what's happening has a sick sort of logic. Break my spirit before breaking into the RV. That's when I decide, if those footsteps circle back to the door... I'm gonna make a break for it. Rifle in hand, I'm not going down without a fight. Then the footsteps fall silent again. That awful tension settles, but I can't bring myself to look out. I sit there, waiting, rifle clutched so tight my knuckles ache. Come sunrise, I find myself checking the side of the RV. There's no trace of anyone being there, not even any footprints. It leaves me doubting myself, wondering if it was all stress or fatigue causing hallucinations. The woods are back to being silent, just the rustle of leaves and the distant calls of birds. That peaceful nature scene felt almost mocking. That day I stayed inside the RV, blinds closed, rifle loaded. When evening approached, the dread I thought had started to lift came back full force. The knowledge that darkness was coming back, and so was whatever had visited the night before. The moment that first shadow hit, my decision was made. Waiting around was as good as a death sentence. I grabbed my rifle, a few basic supplies I could stuff into my backpack, and my keys. This was beyond rational thought. I just knew I had to get out of that campground. Starting the RV is the loudest damn thing I've ever done. With shaking hands, I throw it into gear. My headlights cast shaky beams into the trees as I creep up the gravel road. Every snapping twig, every rustle, has me flinching. I hit the main road and finally let my foot press hard on the gas. Every mile was a victory, a little more distance between me and whatever was back there. After an hour of frantic driving, I come to a crossroads. Now what? This wasn't some backwoods cabin where help seemed an impossibility. My gut tells me that going on a main road wasn't safe. There's no way someone playing mind games like that out in the woods wouldn't see a lone RV speeding at night. If those woods had eyes, the road certainly would too. The whole area felt tainted somehow. That's when I saw the flickering sign, a small rest stop nestled amongst the trees. It wasn't ideal, but a semi-hidden spot felt infinitely better than staying on the open road. I maneuvered the RV in behind some of the pines, hoping whatever blend in I could manage was enough. Then, it was more waiting. Every gust of wind against the pines seemed to bring them closer. Was I imagining it or was a distant scraping noise starting up again? Just when the sun starts to color the sky, I make a move. 
Leaving the RV feels like walking into a trap, but that was part of the gamble. If whoever was watching sees the empty camper, that might buy me enough time to make it to a highway or call for help. Maybe with my luck, an actual trucker would take my tale seriously, and we could go back armed to the teeth to investigate. Yeah, a hopeful pipe dream, but what other choice did I have? Stepping outside is surreal. The world looks the same birds chirping, soft morning light. Yet I know deep down, nothing will ever be the same. There are things out there beyond your average bear or cougar. The world feels bigger, wilder, and a hell of a lot less trustworthy. I make my way through the pines, not daring to look back. Every mile feels like borrowed time. It takes until mid-afternoon for me to stumble across a truck stop buzzing with activity. I see someone in an oil company overalls at a gas pump, and the words spill out of me in a torrent. At first, they look at me like I'm some crazed hobo. But in the back of their eyes, I see a flicker of something else, maybe not belief, but at least some recognition that whatever I saw out there, something's wrong with it. They offer me a lift to the nearest sheriff's station. You know how these stories usually go. Sheriff gives me a tired look, offers a cup of bad coffee, and implies maybe I should lay off the booze or whatever crazy drugs these wilderness types are into nowadays. Didn't go that way. The sheriff listened, brow furrowed, asked questions not even I fully understood. Questions about those gut piles, if I thought someone in the campground might be responsible, how far into the backcountry I'd gone. Turns out there'd been reports of missing hikers lately, some weird disturbances out in the woods. No bodies. No sign of anyone really, which honestly might have been worse. Now, with my story about the RV, it got interesting. Sheriff called and someone called Park Ranger, and suddenly I'm talking with a grizzled guy who looked like he could wrestle a grizzly. Ranger listens dead serious and he doesn't dismiss it. They never came out and said what they thought was out there. Some poacher running a sick intimidation game? Some wild cult gone wrong? No clue. I didn't push it. They drove me back to the campground under armed guard, and my RV was gone. Not stolen, removed. Whatever was at that campsite wasn't something they were willing to risk anyone stumbling across again. I never went back. So that's it. You ask if I believe in stuff in the woods now? You want me to say there are monsters out there? No. What I believe is scarier. There are people out there. People who get off on breaking you down just to see what you'll do to survive. That, more than any beast has my fear. There's only one guarantee when you head into the wilderness you never really know what's just out of sight. This happened to me back during my cross-country road trip days, when life was less about spreadsheets and more about seeing where the highway would take me. Name's Ezra, by the way. Now, I never considered myself those outdoors acclimber types, but after months of cramped motels, the idea of camping at Glacier National Park seemed like a little slice of wilderness I couldn't pass up. Plus, with my small RV setup, it felt less like roughing it and more like a mobile hotel room with a killer view. First day at the park is everything those postcards promise. The mountains that look painted on, those pine forests the air just smells fresher in, and a lake so clear it feels fake. There's that buzz you get when you realize how small you are compared to all that nature, humbling, in a good way. After setting up camp, I strike up a conversation with some couple at the next side over. Turns out they're avid hikers, been coming to Glacier for years. 
I guess I must have seemed too enthusiastic because they give me that look folks give when they think you're about to make a terrible, possibly life-ending mistake. Before I can say anything, the woman points out how late it's getting and says with this real serious tone, Sun goes down, different kind of critters come out. These woods ain't Disney. Okay, maybe they have a point. This city slicker is probably making some glaring newbie errors. The couple wishes me luck with a hint of pity, and I end up back in my RV that evening feeling equal parts pumped for some serious outdoors time and mildly freaked by the implied man-eating grizzly situation. Sleeps rough. That first night alone in the woods has got my imagination going every little rustle in the leaves becomes some stealthy predator creeping up. Sunrise can't come soon enough. Turns out I wasn't alone in my sleeplessness. There's a lone pickup truck parked near the main campsite entrance as I step out of my RV that definitely wasn't there last night. It's an older model, muddy paint job, something a local might drive more than a tourist. The lights are off, windows up. There's that gut feeling something wasn't right about that truck. Could it be someone camping illegally? Park Ranger would love to know about that. Figure I'd best take my own advice from last night. Get myself busy. Fill my head with stuff other than lurking bears or weirdos in trucks. That means hitting up one of the smaller trails that cuts from the campground into the backwoods. This one isn't for the casual strollers. More the sort seasoned folks tackle as a warm-up. I pack supplies, make sure my phone has a signal, and hit the trailhead. Now, if this were a movie, this is when I find something gnarly. Not here. Trail's tough, but pretty uneventful for the first few miles. Even start having that classic moment where you forget all your city stress and just get into the rhythm of walking through trees. Bad move for paying attention to your surroundings, maybe, cause that's why I almost walk face first into it. At first, you'd only spot it if you knew what to look for, a flash of bright blue spray paint on a tree trunk. Not some natural mark, too high up for some animal. I stop, and that's when I notice another mark further on, and another beyond that. This wasn't some trail guide. These are deliberately spaced intervals. Someone was out here recently doing, well, I still don't know what, but that wrongness feeling from the pickup truck returns. My curiosity outweighs my brain for once and I start following that little paint path. That leads me to it. Wouldn't call it a campsite exactly. More a clearing where things look, again, deliberately messed with. Someone broke branches up here, stacked them up neat against a tree. There's a flattened patch of grass like someone slept there. Some torn bits of a tarp are caught in the bushes. There are no food wrappers, beer cans, no sign of an actual camper. No sign of whoever decided to use those bright blue spray-painted tags either. This isn't lost hikers. This is someone marking off their territory. Someone hiding out. Maybe that pickup truck is connected somehow? That's how my brain's connecting things anyway. My logical option now would be to hike on out of there, find a park ranger, report what I'd seen. But you got my number. Curiosity kills the common sense I should have been born with. Instead, I keep following those little tags further into the woods. Each clearing brings some new bit of weirdness. More stacked branches, another patch of trampled grass, even once what looked like a pile of singed clothes someone carefully arranged and then burned. And under it all, that growing tension, like being watched. The park might be huge, but out here, it feels like the walls are closing in. That's when I reach the last tag. This one's painted lower, on a rock overlooking a ravine. My blood runs cold. The view. It shouldn't exist. I'm no geologist, but you don't find perfectly circular lakes nestled into mountains like that. 
This was May blasted out. Some crater someone tried to hide amongst the pines. Something about the light reflecting off the water gives me the chills, and in that split second, I see a flash of movement below. My mind scrambles there's some structure down there. That's when I hear a sound behind me. It's just leaves rustling, a branch snapping, but the message is clear, stop looking. It's time to get the hell out of there. Flight or fight kicks in, and yeah, this boy chose flight. Back the way I came, every little sound echoing and multiplying in my head. I get back to the campground, but not to the safety you'd expect. The pickup truck is gone. But what is there is this sense of the place feeling hollowed out, all the folks with their hiking poles and fancy gear seeming somehow oblivious to what might be waiting in those trees. Did I have proof of whatever was out there? No. Was it even human? That I couldn't say for sure. All I know is some piece of that untamed wild you don't see on travel posters reached out and touched me that day. It's left me cautious. You still find me outdoors, but never without looking back into the shadows, wondering if something is finally ready to step out and return the favor. This happened to me a couple of years back. Still makes me look over my shoulder when I'm out and about, even in broad daylight. Don't get me wrong, I enjoy hiking as much as the next guy. Grew up in the suburbs, and you develop a love-hate relationship with the great outdoors. It calls to you, this feeling of escaping the daily grind, but there's also the nagging thought that sometimes, nature ain't so welcoming. My buddy Cade talked me into this specific trip. He's from Colorado, knows his way around a rock and a ridge. I'm Joel, by the way, city boy and self-proclaimed reluctant adventurer. We picked a place out there in Nevada, something called Basin and Range National Monument. Sounds scenic enough, right? Turns out it's known for being isolated, like way, way out of range. That should have been my first warning sign. First night, everything's chill. Kate sets up the RV while I make an attempt at getting a decent campfire going. Turns out, surviving in the wild isn't my strong suit. It's just the two of us, miles from civilization, and I wouldn't mind admitting that this gives me the jitters. But we laugh it off, beer helps settle my nerves. Things, you know... Things started going wrong that second day. We set out on a planned route. Nothing too major, but enough to test my novice legs. It was mid-afternoon, a relentless sun hanging overhead. Suddenly, Cade pulls up short. In the middle of the trail, there's this shape. Looks like fabric, soaked in, well, the unmistakable dark rust color of dried blood. Right beside it, half hidden in the dust, we spot a bone. I don't need a biology degree to tell it's not some deer that wandered off course. No, sir, this leg bone is way too thick, the joint massive. We back up slowly, trying to keep our cool. We don't talk much, just get back to the RV in double time. We decide to make it a short trip, get the heck out of there. But back at the camp spot, it gets worse. My tires, all four of them, have been slashed clean through. Panics a fist tightening in my chest. Cade checks his cell service. The little bars aren't there anymore. That's when we start hearing the noises. Not quite animal, not quite human. More of a rustling, punctuated by guttural grunts. I tell Kate I think it's coyotes, but even I don't buy it. They don't sound right. I grip a heavy flashlight, trying to feel less useless. There's no way Kate and I are sleeping out there that night. He packs us some supplies, and we set off. 
Aim is to walk down the road until we're hopefully within cell range. But that leg bone we spotted keeps flashing in my mind. Whatever got that animal isn't something I want to stumble onto in the dark, surrounded by these rock formations reaching up like crooked fingers. We walk as quietly as possible. No conversation, just listening intently for more of those eerie grunts. Hours and miles later, we hit a stroke of luck. There's a flickering of signal on Cade's phone. My adrenaline surges with hopeful relief, thinking he can finally call for help. But that fades almost immediately with the realization. We're still so remote, there's barely one bar. Cade manages to dial. Something might have broken through. An automated message. Just the generic county emergency line. That's it. Signal flickers back out. Now what? This feels hopeless. But I have to admit, it feels better than sitting and waiting in that RV for another round with whatever made those horrifying noises. Dawn's our savior. Just enough light peeks through to see where we're going without stumbling into a cactus. Nevada deserts have plenty of those. Suddenly, Cade shouts a warning, and my foot instinctively halts inches from movement. I look down and freeze. There, right across the trail, fresh paw prints in the dirt. Big ones, easily double the size of a mountain lion. They're deep, and there's something off about the claws. Cade kneels down for a closer look, then looks up at me. We know this isn't natural. Not some normal creature walking this land. Whatever left those prints, there's a feeling we shouldn't get in its way. The RV seems far, far behind us. But suddenly, that metal box holds an odd sense of safety compared to the vast landscape in front of us. The grunting started again. Sounds closer now. Not gonna lie, fear gnaws at me like a rat. We break into a jog ignoring the burning in our lungs. Cade glances back every once in a while, not sure if I could handle what he might spot. And we keep running, the grunts echoing ever closer, the landscape our prison. My mind races, a hundred useless escape plans flashing and dying in my head. And somehow, the RV stands defiant as we scramble back across the dusty terrain. Cade shoves me inside locking the door just as the sound of footsteps hits the ground outside. We huddle together, eyes widening as the first thud strikes against the side of the vehicle. Each successive one makes it shudder. I have this crazy image of it tipping over completely, sending us rolling with our predator. In the sliver of a moon filtering through the window, I see it. Just a glimpse because I ain't looking again. I can't take another look. It was enough to tell me that whatever it is, those grunts aren't animals. The way it moved wasn't right either. Two legs, yes, but hunched in an unnatural way. The shoulders wider than its squat torso, head low to the ground like it could scent us like prey. My stomach churns, and bow threatens to rise up. The thuds against the RV continue punctuated by that sound that has followed us, those awful, half-familiar grunts that are nothing short of chilling. That's the truth that hits hardest, that whatever creature made them almost sound sort of human, but twisted wrong, maybe even mocking us, savoring our fear. They continue long into the night. In the still silence of dawn, there's no sound. Cade dares to check outside. I stay crouched under the flimsy table. When he calls my name, his voice sounds thick with a horror I share. Something's different at our campsite. We find blood dragged across the dusty ground, splattered against the tires. But there's no body. I don't ask, because it's clear what happened. In a daze, we climb inside and Cade gets the engine running. A passerby was our rescuer, flagged them down in a daze along the roadside. The police were the next stop. 
I'm sure those folks thought we were delusional, ranting about animal prints and things. The report, if there is one, probably describes it as a possible mountain lion attack with some good old-fashioned rambling hiker trauma on top. Don't blame them. I sure as hell wish I could buy this simple explanation. We never went back to basin and range. I ain't going back to any wilderness without at least three buddies and a satellite phone. You better believe I keep an eye out even around here in my safe suburb when the light starts to go dim. Because something else lurks out there. This happened to me a couple of summers back. Even now, sometimes when I get restless and bored, I catch myself planning road trips, but always those well-populated freeways. Backwoods adventures? Forget it. No way in hell. My name's Elias, by the way, photographer by trade. This ain't something I talk about much. It just makes me sound crazy. You see, my gig at the time was this whole Americana travel series. The brief document Small Town Charm, Off the Beaten Path Places, that type of thing. I rolled into New Mexico in an RV I barely knew how to handle. One of those clumsy rental models they advertise as easy even for novices. My destination, San Lorenzo Canyon out east. It's the epitome of remote. Miles of empty landscape, dotted with ancient rock formations. The plan was to camp off some minor road that cuts through it. My first mistake was ignoring those local gas station warnings about flash floods they happen with brutal surprise out there, apparently. It seemed stupid even to an inexperienced road tripper like me. First couple of days weren't so bad. Got lucky with a sliver of signal on my phone and managed to send off some good shots to my editor. Evenings were peaceful. Sure, I didn't find some ghost town, but this canyon had a raw beauty. But as you well know, things out in the vast emptiness go south real fast. The weather. I should have listened to those red-faced guys by the pumps. One minute the sky's a canvas of the deepest blue. The next it's rolling in with rain clouds that look almost black. My RV was pretty damn exposed. I remember thinking, I'm the highest thing amidst this flat rock for miles. This was when a wave of nausea and fear struck me like a damn bolt from the blue. I just had a certainty there was a storm a coming. And not just some storm like one of those monstrous desert events that tears trees out by the root. There was no time to drive further. Instead, I pulled off the road into a half-dry side stream, figured that if it rains at least the ground might act as some sort of basin. Inside the RV, I braced myself. The wind hit hard, rocking the metal box against its shocks. I kept waiting for the full weight of the rain, hoping my shoddy cover wasn't about to turn the whole journey into a total disaster. It never came. But the wind grew worse and something about the sound, well, it gave me chills. Every so often there'd be a strange sort of howl that was unlike anything I've ever heard, like a chorus of coyotes and screaming birds somehow merged into one sound. My mind conjured up images of whirlwinds, of that RV rolling over under the onslaught. Maybe a twisted branch flying right through the flimsy window like a spear. That's the sort of overactive panic that takes over your rational mind out there, alone and exposed to nature at its harshest. I was stuck between dread of the coming storm and dread of what else might be outside. My heart pounded in my ears. I felt like throwing up. There was nothing to it but to stick it out and pray to other gods in which I normally have zero belief. It gets bad out there on the bad days. I'm telling you, nothing good walks under that black sky. Hours and hours went by. Finally, I peeked out a narrow window into that gray curtain of a world. 
that wind just wouldn't give in. This is about when I made my big mistake, one that was born out of fear and pure bone-deep exhaustion. Thinking maybe, just maybe, I could catch some shrep eye while it wasn't actively downpouring. And somehow, someway, I did doze off, a fitful dream riddled sleep broken by the rattling of the RV from all angles. A sudden jolt that woke me in a cold sweat. My body moved before my brain registered that something was pushing into the side of the damn thing. Not the wind it was this heavy, rhythmic impact. That same guttural moan mixed with what sounded like an irritated whimper, just outside. There was something alive against the outside wall, pushing like it could actually tip the rig over. My mind jumped from wild ideas, mountain lion, fallen tree, escaped bull, it could have been anything. Fear kept me paralyzed, and then I was crawling forward and peeking just enough to see into the gloom. The shape shifted, and for a moment, all rationality slipped straight from my grasp. The form just shouldn't have been possible. Its silhouette, too elongated, limbs just a shade too long to be animal-like. But then it shifted just enough for me to see its face a turn back for one brief glance at the RV as it skulked further off. Now, look some would call this hallucination, but there's a clarity to fear that I'll never forget. Its skin had a grayish tinge, like a photo negative gone slightly green. There wasn't much detail due to the low light, mostly its shadowed outline and one thing very clear. It held itself on two feet. This is when I snapped into an adrenalized action. The ignition turned with trembling hands, and I yanked the RV into gear. Whatever monstrous being had taken interest in the metal shelter I'd hidden in, it sure as hell didn't follow. There was the feeling of eyes trailing me, watching from the canyon shadows as I raced back away from that desolate beauty out of New Mexico. I never sent word on what I saw, what would I even say? I know if I ever did, my phone would ping back with suggestions on local psychedelics and the effects of sunstroke. It's hardwired into us to deny what we cannot comprehend. To brush away the impossible as something our minds conjure up under moments of sheer, unimaginable terror. When I arrived in the next one-horse town with gas— coffee and cell coverage, it was almost a relief to learn there was a minor earthquake reported nearby. A natural phenomenon, my rattled brain grasped for explanations. An aftershock, it made sense of the unnatural tremors the previous day. My fear subsided somewhat, at least to a dull gnawing terror I thought I might be able to ignore. And I managed to carry on for a while finished up that assignment like the damn professional I'm supposed to be. Every so often, when I had enough of the concrete jungle I call home and started planning the next escape, somewhere deep in the back of my mind I would get those phantom tremors again, just the slightest echo of that day of unrelenting wind and rhythmic thumping against the outside wall of the RV. That glimpse of a grotesque creature, was it ever really there? Or was it some horrifying trick of the light? One thing is for damn sure there are places I ain't gonna go looking for. The world has dark corners, some more literal than others, and it wasn't meant for us in all its monstrous glory. This happened to me a few years back during one of my regular solo ventures. See, I'm into long-distance backpacking. The more isolated, the better. It's about that push, finding some inner strength as much as it is about scenic routes. My name's Thaddeus, but everyone calls me Thad. This trip's goal, the Appalachian Trail, deep into the lush forests of northern Georgia, had some decent weather reports, good enough to last five days or so. Now, you should know my style. Less about pre-planning, more about just winging it, 
finding a trailhead and hitting the ground running. That spontaneity led me to this off-the-beaten-path trail deep in the heart of the Chattahoochee Forest. Not much info available online, but damn if it didn't look perfect. That first day was pretty damn exhilarating. Steep ascents, dense undergrowth. It had everything I craved. But by evening, with a decent campsite located, fatigue hit hard. You don't realize how those little moments of adrenaline stack up. One minute you're setting up the tent, the next your flashlight's beam catches this thing. Movement maybe 200 feet away, right on the edge of the tree line. My heart kicks up a notch, big cat? That'd explain the stealth. What happens next, I still struggle to believe. It steps forward just slightly giving me a partial profile against the dusk light. Tall. Lanky. Definitely not a bear or anything normal. Then it just vanishes into the brush. My brain plays tricks. Shadows of branches must have done it. The sense of unease remains, but after a good night's sleep, it feels like a strange half-remembered dream. Day two starts off strong, and that initial weirdness fades. My usual pace is faster here. Maybe that initial unease had some residual influence on my subconscious. This trail, it wins a lot. Turns back on itself. My sense of direction, usually excellent, starts feeling off. But who cares when this kind of natural beauty surrounds you? I even joke out loud that if I keep walking in circles, that's just more time with these ancient trees. By third day in, that joke doesn't feel so funny anymore. It's subtle at first. Feeling eyes on me, an odd sense of deja vu with certain trail markers. But that nagging voice tells me it's my overactive imagination. When you do solo hikes, the mind finds weird little ways to entertain itself. Or maybe those woods get to you like that after a while. Then the clearing happened. Now, there was absolutely no indication that I'd come across this spot before. This was new territory. My route was meticulously outlined for just this scenario. No way should I've arrived back here a wide, flat space ringed by towering pines. Yet, it felt so unsettlingly familiar. And at the far end, nestled right where the trail led back into the woods, was a structure. Not your run-of-the-mill hiker's shelter, something older, a simple cabin. My curiosity overpowers any lingering caution. It turns out to be unlocked. The inside has this untouched quality, yet not abandoned. There are supplies, but dusty. Old newspapers with yellowed pages litter a side table. What pulls my focus, though, is this map tacked to the peeling wall. It's ancient, detailing these very woods. But some hand-drawn markings, scribbled arrows and notes. I feel the hairs on my neck stand on end. They trace a route that matches, almost exactly, my own haphazard wanderings through this dense forest. Now, alarm bells are blaring full force. This place. There's intention in that map. The cabin wasn't just discovered. It was sought out. My exit is quick, almost a scramble back into the sunlight. That familiar path unfurls into the pines, a mocking sign of normalcy compared to what lurked inside. That evening... It wasn't just the setting sun giving me an uneasy feeling. This was when I found it. That same damn lanky silhouette, stalking me just ahead. Moving parallel to the trail, mirroring my every step. At least now there was clear sight of the thing. Long legs, almost unnaturally so, with this hunched gait. Then, for a chilling moment, it turns its head slightly in my direction. That face, if you can call it that. Like a smooth, featureless egg laid atop its shoulders. No eyes, no mouth, nothing recognizable. Every cell in my body screamed to run, 
but some morbid fascination held me rooted. Then it was gone again, dissolving back into the dense undergrowth. By dawn, I'd packed camp at a speed bordering on Manic. There was nowhere to go but ahead, back down the trail that had led me into this mess. But by midday, it felt like every turn brought nothing new. My footsteps echoed against the same giants I'd been passing for days. I finally broke, yelling, probably more to convince myself I wasn't just insane. At least there was an answer, sort of. An odd sound coming from up ahead. Like nails against wood, only a slow, deliberate scratch. That damn cabin loomed up again. There, on the dusty porch, was some fresh movement. That hunched form, only, something in its arms. My brain scrambled. Was it holding another person? No, the size was wrong, almost childlike. There was something shiny, catching the sunlight as it swayed slightly in that creature's grip. My blood ran cold. A deer antler, and hanging just beneath, a torn scrap of blue nylon that matched the exact shade of my jacket. No question, it had caught my scent. The creature had tracked me for miles. My mind races back to that dusty map in the cabin. Was I simply its newest addition? A specimen to be tracked, hunted. Who knows what twisted fate awaited me within those walls? That's my turning point. No way I was facing whatever waited inside that cabin. Instead, there was the dense forest, and with primal determination, I dove in. Every sense was on overload, every snapping twig a predator behind me. My legs burn, lungs aching, but fear propels me faster than I've ever moved. After what feels like a lifetime, a shimmer of pale road breaks through the green gloom. Never has civilization looked so damn sweet. Stumbling to the edge of that asphalt, hitching a ride with a wide-eyed truck driver, my only words were, Please, just keep driving. Now some folks have theories about backwoods cults, or government experiments gone wrong. Me? I don't know what that thing was, what sick obsession drew it to that damn cabin in the woods. I just know my return route from there was deliberately vague. No one would believe me if I tried to explain the unmarked trails. There's a reason there was no trace of that place ever existing. Those old Appalachian woods might hide beauty, but they also hold dark secrets best left undisturbed. I still hike, but these days I choose well-charted routes, those paths less likely to turn on you when you least expect it. This happened to me a few years ago. Looking back, the whole thing seems ridiculous, the type of tale you brush off with a nervous laugh in company. Of course, at the time, it was far from laughable. I'm a city guy born and bred. The idea of getting close to nature fills me with an odd mix of anxiety and boredom. That said, my cousin Joel talks a good game when it comes to the beauty of the real America. And well, my wife Karen, bless her, wanted to make him happy. It was his fortieth, after all. Thus, in what can only be described as a lapse of judgment, I found myself wedged into an oversized RV, heading through the vast open spaces of the Nevada desert. Not my scene at all. Now, Joel, he was like a kid at Christmas. My aunt and uncle even chipped in. They rented the thing specifically because he's never been out of the city before, except for one time visiting Grandma. Bless their hearts. First couple of days weren't so bad. Mostly driving. There's not much to do inside one of those glorified buses but eat and sleep. I felt bad for Karen. She got stuck navigating these little backroads while the rest of us chilled out. Finally, we got close to Joel's dream destination, 
a place called Red Rock Canyon. He couldn't stop talking about the formations, the hikes. Honestly, it all sounded like different shades of brown to me. But hey, keep Sim smiling. We picked a spot just off the trail, a real remote kind of place. Sun's low in the sky, casts long shadows on the boulders. It's quiet, peaceful almost. Then my end notices. The tires slashed. We check them all, and another's been cut clean down the side. At this point, doubt sinks in. It couldn't be an accident. We're stranded miles from civilization on purpose. My stomach knots up. We gotta get help. I insist. I look to Joel, Karen. There's fear in their eyes, too. But there's no cell service. Not surprising out here, of course, but a punch in the gut nonetheless. Night rolls in faster than you'd think in the desert. We rig up with flashlights, but darkness in a place like that, there's a type of heaviness to it. Every rustle in the brush makes me jump. Karen stays tight by my side. You feel vulnerable, exposed. I swear I hear voices out there, low whispers on the wind, carrying on the night air. But whenever we chase the sound, nothing. My mind works overtime, conjuring up images of some backwoods lunatic stalking us. Maybe it's just the stress playing with my head. That's when the rock hits the RV. A solid thump echoes through the metal shell. Then another, and another. We huddle together, unsure what to do. It stops as suddenly as it started. Joel cracks a worried joke, trying to lighten the mood. Guess someone wanted our parking spot. Doesn't quite land. That night, none of us sleeps easily. Every little creak and groan feels like someone circling, closing in. I know, it sounds pathetic, but you try being there and see how calm you stay. Morning light brings no relief, only rising dread. It's decided, we'll try to hike out. We pack essentials, water mostly, and leave a note under the windshield. I explain the tires, tell whoever finds it we left on foot for the nearest town. We'd rather take our chances walking than stay there another night. Trail winds between giant sandstone formations, like colossal red teeth flanking the path. With every turn, I keep glancing over my shoulder, expecting to see. I don't even know what I expect to see. Maybe a figure lurking just out of sight? I find myself checking my watch even though time has practically vanished in my internal clock of fear. We push on, step by step. No talking, just the sound of boots on rough earth. It's strange how even with company, I've never felt more alone. The sun bears down, the dry heat like a furnace blast with every gust of wind. We're not made for this kind of walking. I can see it in the others, in the slump of their shoulders, the slowing pace. My legs burn. There's something about being this exposed, under a sky this wide. It makes you feel insignificant. And then, another flash of panic. Ahead, on the trail, a dark stain. Not the red of the rocks, something deeper and wet. We get closer and gasp in unison. There lies a bird, wings splayed at awkward angles, feathers matted with a thick crimson smear. I kneel down, the blood still sticky. Something killed this, and not long ago. Fear surges through me, a real primal response. My aunt starts sobbing, a mix of despair and terror. My voice gets rough as I command we turn back. Joel fights me on it for a moment his stubbornness flaring up. They probably took pity. He tries to sound positive. Slashed the tires so we wouldn't wander, and then left when they realized. His sentence trails off, none of us by it. There's malice in the act, I recognize it instinctively. This wasn't some misguided help. 
We retreat to the RV, hearts pounding. Back to square one. A few more sleepless hours pass, and again the stones start hitting the metal. The pattern keeps up, relentless. I try to focus on the breathing of the others, to calm my ragged nerves. Then it changes. There's a scraping sound now, something dragging itself along the side. Karen whimpers beside me, and I pull her close protectively. The noise persists, the scraping now interspersed with heavy, irregular thumps against the vehicle. Every bump makes the RV rock slightly, my imagination running wild. My heart thunders in my chest, and that's when I see it. Through the dusty window, there's a form outside. In the pale moonlight, a silhouette hulks by the door. Its shoulders are too broad, arms too long, and I could swear the head doesn't sit quite right. The way it moves isn't natural, a lurching, uneven gait. I can't make out details, but I know instinctively this isn't something natural, isn't some regular person wandering alone at night. The thing pauses, and it feels like my soul freezes in my chest. But then, it shuffles away, back into the night. There's a sound like claws dragging against metal as it moves, sending waves of dread through me. The sun's only a few hours off now, but we won't last until then. The thing, whatever it is, it comes back every night. It's playing with us. My mind runs in circles through impossible escape plans while simultaneously telling me we're doomed, that it's only a matter of time, that this night might well be our last. Dawn arrives in a smear of sickly gray. In those thin streaks of light, something shifts in me. I find a spark of determination, born from raw desperation. It can't end like this. There are some tools under the driver's seat, basic stuff, not much we can make use of. One thing does catch my eye, though, a hefty lug wrench. If that thing comes close again, at least I have something more than my bare hands. I tuck it discreetly at my side and force myself to think, to plan. It's the only way I can stop my nerves from unraveling completely. By daylight, my aunt and uncle have given in to pure exhaustion. It feels heartless, but this gives me more room to work. It would be impossible to shield them while simultaneously confronting the, well, whatever it is lurking out there. That thought still shivers down my spine, even in the light of day. I tell them to make themselves as small as possible behind the seats, stay under cover where they can't be seen through the windows. They obey with silent understanding their eyes wide with terror-filled compliance. Karen squeezes my hand, her skin clammy. Just the touch brings a flicker of strength back. For her, we wouldn't give up without a fight. There's a cooler we manage to jam under the dashboard. I wrench it out. Inside are just a few melted snacks and warm water bottles. I take one and unscrew the lid. There's no grand plan here just pure instinct. This water is our ammunition. Now for the hardest part, waiting. Time crawls. Even with the engine off, the desert heat bakes through the metal. Every minute drags like an hour. Every rustling shadow at the window makes my stomach clench. But somehow, the hours slip by without our nocturnal stalker returning. I realize... It knows night is its time to play its cruel games. The light, even this weak daylight, offers some sort of protection. My nerves remain at full battle readiness, but a cautious flicker of hope burns beneath them. Sunset looms, casting long, jagged shadows across the rocks. My body goes rigid. With the dwindling light comes the realization time's running out. The waiting for it might end up worse than the thing itself. Joel stirs from his exhausted slumber with a confused groan. Don't. I warn him, finger to my lips. 
The tension snaps around us like a live wire. I feel them behind me, eyes wide with that familiar mix of fear and confusion, all unspoken questions hanging thick in the hot, stale air of the RV. My hand tightens around the lug wrench. And then, there it is. The scrape of claws, the lurching silhouette appearing out of the deepening dusk. This time, it lingers by the driver's side window, peering directly in. I can't make out any features, just that sense of something horribly wrong, like a twisted distortion of a person. There's a hungry intentness there, something chillingly deliberate. That's the moment I break. Not in fear, but in pure, unbridled rage. With a primal yell, I launch myself forward, smashing open the door. I raise the wrench, ready to defend my family, myself, whatever, even if it's a futile, suicidal act. But whatever intelligence exists in those shadowy eyes must recognize the shift, the desperate determination I hold. For a terrifyingly long moment, we stare each other down. It's like a duel with unimaginable stakes. In that moment, there's the flash of the water bottle against the backdrop of the darkening sky. An act born of instinct rather than reason. The splash makes it flinch, and even in the gloom, I see whatever skin I hit redden as if burned. Its lanky frame twists back, then melts into the night. Its retreat brings no satisfaction, no real sense of victory, just bone-deep relief. My body sags against the RV, and there's a shaking I can't control. We survived another night. We wait until the first tentative streaks of dawn before daring to move. Joel takes over the wheel. I won't lie, my hands don't quite work right. It feels like another lifetime back on those smooth, paved roads. There's no cell service, but at least there are other cars, normal cars. Just seeing them feels like a lifeline. With luck, it wouldn't be too long before we are in eyesight of some semblance of civilization. It might just be our lifeline after all. We flag down a pickup truck, an older couple staring down curiously at our slashed tires. My story sounds insane, even as I'm saying it. The looks they exchange. I get it. I expect skepticism, a hint of amused accusation. Instead, their faces go pale, and there's a flicker of recognition in their eyes, fear, and maybe a trace of pity. I want to demand answers, but they won't meet my stare. We exchange contact information just in case— then they're hurrying back to their car, casting fleeting glances towards the fading desert horizon. There are hush whispers about local stories as we roll into a quiet town, tales passed down, rumors about things glimpsed in the shadows out there. We get checked out at a clinic, treated for dehydration, mild shock. There are police reports, of course, and lots of unanswered questions. They look at us with a mix of skepticism and disbelief, like we're either lying or have lost our minds. I never saw the thing again. I won't pretend I believe my water bottle stunt chased it back to whatever lair it crawls in and out of. There's something out there in those empty spaces, in the margins of light and darkness. You wouldn't catch me willingly getting that close to finding out again. We stayed the night at a generic motel clinging to the artificial hum of the lights like it was our sanctuary. There are whispers still, from that couple in the truck, from locals we ran into at the diner. Stories told in hushed tones about things out there in those vast, lonely landscapes. You're called dramatic, told you saw nothing, and maybe you start to doubt the experience yourself in the harsh clarity of day. But in those still, sleepless nights... The memory of that silhouette against the rising moon burns so vividly that even I start to question what is real and what's a trick of the night. But one thing I know with absolute certainty there's no amount of city lights bright enough to erase that primal flicker of terror, 
The lingering sensation of being something out there in the desert darkness had us marked for its prey. This happened to me a couple of years back, during a solo road trip I'd been craving for ages. You have those urges sometimes, when a desk job and life's pressures start feeling smothering. I packed my trusty rig, hit the open road, and promised myself that week belonged entirely to me. Turns out, it wasn't just my week to claim. My name's Brecken, by the way. City-raised, outdoors enthusiast. Always looking for something a little out of the ordinary. My destination? The stunning red rock expanse of Utah's deserts. Canyonlands, Zion. It had the isolation I was dreaming of and a challenge thrown in, with some serious hiking trails marked on my map. Turns out, my first real day wasn't that different from anyone else's on vacation. Set up base camp near a gorgeous butte. Got a fire going, the typical stuff. Had every intention of hitting a nice sunset trail before dark. But, you know how it is. That sunset came up fast, beer went down too easy, and suddenly it was pitch black. Figured tomorrow would do just fine. It started that next morning. Hike up to the butte was glorious even better than the photos advertised. That panoramic view, breathtaking. Maybe I did feel a bit exposed up there, a lone figure against such rugged landscape. But exhilarating, right? Coming down, something on the path caught my eye, like a flash of dark against the pale canyon floor. First thought was that it was an animal, but as I focused, realized the shape wasn't right. Tall, skinny, hunched over? Binoculars were back at camp, and whatever it was had bolted behind some rocks anyway. My pulse quickened a bit, curiosity mixed with some unease. The sensible voice surged a return to camp. No big deal. Probably a lone hiker just like me. Back at my rig, it felt kind of foolish. Second-guessing myself, you know the drill. Yet, as evening started to fall, couldn't shake that unsettling feeling. It got amplified as soon as darkness really set in. I'm convinced my brain conjured it at first, like a scratching near the rear of my RV. Could have been wind, branches, any number of things. But you see, something primal in me went on alert. I froze, then edged toward a window for a peek. I'll be honest— it's all blurry now. There was movement beyond my firelight, and there it was again. Same posture, but something had definitely changed. Bigger, bulkier almost. Had this thing grown from what I vaguely saw on the mountain path? Whatever it was, it didn't stand like any human I'd ever met. That was the turning point. The logical bit of me knew something was very, very wrong. It went beyond instinct. Every rational fiber told me that I wasn't dealing with just another hiker out there. But damned if I wasn't gripped with morbid curiosity. I made sure my headlights were off, then carefully opened the camper door. Bad idea, yeah, but adrenaline does things to you. I'm convinced the only reason it didn't spot me immediately was because of the fire's reflection on the RV. This is when it got really messed up. There on the ground, near a clump of scrub, that damn thing was hunkered over, something else. Another figure smaller, and I still cannot make sense of it, misshapen, limbs all wrong, skin a sickly pale with this weird sheen. This wasn't natural. No way. The smaller figure seemed lifeless. That thing, it turned slightly giving me a partial view. This time, I understood why those earlier glimpses on the mountain had thrown me so badly. This thing had no face, not really. Some vaguely skin-covered indentations were there, but no eyes, no mouth, 
no recognizable features at all. I slammed the door. Fear hit me like a freight train. Mikey's eye fumbled them onto the floor and my scramble to turn that engine over. Thank God the damn thing started on the first try. With headlights roaring, I saw a dart for the tree lean. But in the harsh beams, others stood at the edge of the light, all with that same hunched posture. Too many. I couldn't count them all before the RV lurched into gear. Gravel spewed, my rig jolted violently as I hit the deserted dirt road. There was no plan, just that deep, primal drive to leave them behind. My heart pounded against my ribs, nausea battled with sheer terror. Headlights flickered against the landscape, and they gave chase. It wasn't graceful, a kind of jerky, halting run, but there were so many of them. Then, as suddenly as it had begun, nothing. They stopped dead at some invisible boundary, just inside the last sliver of illumination from my headlights. It was as if they couldn't, or wouldn't, step outside of that circle of light. In that frozen moment, my breath caught in my chest. They just stood there, watching. For how long? I barely recall. Finally, I just drove. Kept driving until exhaustion and relief were fighting it out in my veins. Pulled over into some anonymous truck stop at daybreak, too afraid to sleep with all those windows reflecting the sunrise. My mind still churns over what followed. Did I report it? Hell no. No way anyone would have believed me. Besides, there was only my word and some odd footprints around where I'd been camped. Big ones, the shape all distorted, like evidence washed away by time. Sometimes, though, usually deep in the night when I can't silence the memory, I consider going back. Not to confront those things, but to figure out, to understand what I witnessed. What caused them to be like that? If the curiosity wins out, yeah, that's how they get you, isn't it? Maybe next time I'll bring a bigger gun. Or maybe that kind of thinking leads straight back to that empty desert in the dead of night, and becoming prey once again. Either way, that unsettling sense of wrongness, it won't ever leave me. This happened to me a few years back. Seems like forever ago. It was my usual fall camping trip, something I looked forward to all year long. Every autumn, I load up my RV and go deep into the forest to soak in the solitude. It's just me and nature, and I wouldn't trade it for anything. I'm no survivalist, far from it, actually. I grew up a city kid with all the modern conveniences but there's something about unplugging for a week that really resets me. This year, I took my trip to the heart of the Ozarks, in Arkansas. This place just sings to me, you've got those rolling hills, crystal clear rivers, and enough dense trees to truly get lost in. It's the getting lost part that keeps me coming back. For me, it's an escape from the constant barrage of life, work, social media, just that gnawing sense of always being connected. In the Ozarks, I become nobody. It's perfect. I parked my RV in a spot beside a winding gravel road. This secluded corner always seems to go untouched, which fits my style. On this first day, after setting up camp, I hit the hiking trails found this lovely old path twisting alongside a river, so serene. Didn't see another soul out there the whole day. Got back to camp just before nightfall, cooked dinner over the fire, and crashed out early. Honestly, a pretty ordinary day. The type you crave when you've had too much of the real world. That first night, something just felt off. There were strange noises coming from deeper in the woods. Mostly rustling, branches snapping. Stuff you expect to hear out there, but my gut gave a twinge. 
It was persistent, this unease. But being overly cautious? I mean, come on. I wrote it off as the wind picking up and decided to turn in. Maybe tomorrow I'd explore and see if anything had been around my campsite. Next morning, I took that planned scouting mission. Nothing. No tracks or signs of any large animals. So, what was my deal the night before? Paranoia? I shrugged it off and decided to enjoy my coffee by the campfire. I settled with a mug and listened to the morning songs of birds. I'd only have another few days of this serenity before facing the grind again. That's when I saw it, this thing. A flash of movement way off in the trees. First thought, a big oil buck. We weren't in deer season, but these woods? There are all sorts of critters I rarely see back home. Curiosity peaked. I slowly stepped in that direction. It appeared again, then ducked deeper into the forest. At this point, I know this wasn't normal behavior, definitely not deer-like. But again, Ozarks, who knows what lurks here? This nagging feeling told me to walk away, back to camp, lock myself in that RV until it was time to leave. But you see, I'm a stubborn guy. My name's Elkin, by the way. Elkin Wilder. The sensible part of me screamed for retreat, but I'm always up for a challenge. What was the worst that could happen? That thought alone should have stopped me. Instead, I went deeper. I followed, trying to be stealthy. Branches whipped against my face, twigs cracked under my boots. Then it reappeared, but closer this time. It moved hunched over, almost ape-like but also distinctly human. It vanished as quickly as it came, just a brief glimpse. Something wasn't right. Now there was fear. My breath quickened. Despite the warning bells I followed. Dumb, right? It wasn't curiosity anymore, but this compulsive need to know. Like I had to unravel this. Whatever it was... This couldn't be natural. The Ozarks might be wild, but they weren't a zoo. And that shape, so strange, so out of place. This went on for a while, this game of cat and mouse. My heart pounded a frantic drumbeat, but the determination remained. Every glimpse showed, well, not much. I'd only get a hint of movement, like it was deliberately obscuring itself from full view. Now, let me describe this thing the best I can. First off, it was big. Tall and wide, way bigger than an average man. The way it moved, it had this unsettling fluidity, but rigid too. Almost like it was constantly twitching, adjusting. That shape I first saw, low and crouched, seemed its default. Each time, that feeling of wrongness would sink in even deeper. Not just fear, but an unease like my primal instincts screamed for safety. I'd almost give up, then there it'd be again, just beyond the trees. Luring me in? I kept thinking I'd get an answer. Find out what the hell was going on. I pushed further and further, until that gravel road and my RV were only a distant memory. Then, finally, something I hadn't prepared for an old trapper's cabin nestled within a clearing. Not that rundown cabin you see in movies. This one looked rough, but lived in. Something told me I wouldn't find friendly neighbors to ask for directions. But the movement, that thing, had disappeared. My legs trembled, not sure if it was exhaustion or terror. This cabin, could there be a connection? Had that figure led me here? Was I losing my mind? That's when it hit me the smells. God, it was foul. Rotting meat, but also something chemical underneath. My stomach lurched. There was that feeling again, an overwhelming sensation of wrong coming from inside that cabin. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. Yet, despite it all, 
an almost perverse desire pulled me closer. I had to see, had to know. This compulsion battled with every screaming instinct to bolt the opposite way. Mistake. That was the turning point. Because what started as just wrong turned into horrifying. I'm going to spare you the gory details, but what lurked in that cabin was beyond what most folks could even fathom. This ain't a ghost story, no sir. This was raw, visceral evil. It was the figure, standing stock still just within the doorway, bathed in shadow. But something had changed. There were others. Twisted, misshapen. I can't even call them human anymore. These things shifted and jerked, yet stayed strangely rigid. Each one different twisted in a unique way, yet sharing this uncanny sameness that froze my blood. And all of them were staring right at me. Then it finally looked. The head of the first figure snapped toward me. There was nothing there where a face should have been. Nothing I could even describe. No way to make sense of it. It let out this, this, keening screech, like rusty nails ripping apart metal. I lost it. Everything after that is a blur of scrambling feet and piercing screams. Mine, I'm sure. Those figures were moving, scrambling. Not gracefully like before, but in a jarring, jerky way. I never knew how fast I could run. Branches slashed at my arms. Mud swallowed my boots. It wasn't enough. That guttural moan grew louder, echoing against the trees. One thing burned through my panic. They were chasing me. The only goal was escape. No destination, just get away. Each ragged gasp burned my lungs. My legs threatened to give out. It wasn't that they were particularly fast, the figures. They staggered in this lurching gait. There was something wrong with the way they moved, yet that didn't make them slow. I remember stumbling onto the gravel road, tears blinding me. My RV! If I could reach it, just a few more yards, maybe I'd have a chance. But that damned keening wail filled my ears. They were closing in. I risked a glance back. They hadn't stopped, hadn't slowed. That same unnatural rigidity seemed to propel them forward. In that panic split second, my foot caught a hidden root. I sprawled hard onto the rough gravel, hands scraping raw. Just before the darkness claimed me, I managed to snatch a final glance, and all those twisted figures were at the edge of the tree line, watching. That stillness again, their unnatural shape stark against the foliage. It felt intentional, predatory. They didn't even attempt to attack as I lay there. Something held them back. I don't know how long I was out. Came to days, the sun starting its descent. Pain bloomed across my entire body, and when I tried to stand, a wave of nausea swept over me. Broken ankle, probably. And there they were, back in the same position. Unmoving. It was as if they never blinked, those empty spaces where faces should be fixated on my position. Night fell, an agonizing stretch of time where survival hinged on pure desperation. It didn't look like they could or would cross out from under the trees. I realized if I crawled, crawled painfully on my belly, toward my RV, the line of sight could break momentarily. It was a sliver of hope, insane as it sounded. And as the sliver remained stubbornly unbroken, I began to believe. They couldn't follow if they couldn't see me. Maybe in those shadows, beneath those trees, something else held them back. With every agonizing twist of my body, that damned moaning chorus never changed in volume. Yet the camper drew closer. Closer, until finally... My outstretched fingers scraped the metal door handle. Somehow, in my fumbling, the door opened. I hauled myself inside, slamming and locking it behind me with barely a second to spare. 
Even within the safety of the camper, the moaning reverberated. That's when I heard it, clawing. Scratching. It was all over the camper's thin sheet metal. Something pounded frantically against the windows. But with dawn, even the scratching finally ceased. Silence. I didn't move. Didn't check until long after the sun was back in the sky. Finally, my shaking hands grasped the steering wheel. My fractured ankle pulsed in protest, but gritting my teeth, I slammed the RV into gear. I barely dared look in the rearview mirror as I left that gravel road behind. Those woods might hold countless unseen horrors, but those figures never chased me again. Years have passed. Still, on particularly silent nights, when the wind whispers through the trees just so, I swear, swear I can hear that low, eerie moaning, that unnatural call. Every time it sends a prickle of ice down my spine. They never caught me. I got lucky. Maybe others haven't. All I know is that whatever dwells in those Ozark woods, it isn't what you'd expect. It's worse. They say ignorance is bliss. Sometimes, curiosity bears a terrible price. I still try to forget the unnatural way they moved, the hollow spaces where their faces should be. It'll haunt me as long as I live. It was an odyssey into the depths of pure fright, an experience that redefined the very notion of terror. For within those shadowy woods, in that isolated realm, the human capacity for unimaginable evil took form. Some monsters lurk in the whispers of legends, Others exist in the harsh light of day. I faced the latter, and it forever changed me. My yearly camping trips never went beyond the local campgrounds after that. I have no explanation for those creatures. Not one that makes any sort of rational sense. Were they failed experiments? Some dark cult's victims? Who knows? But in those moments I felt hunted. Not just stalked, but watched meticulously, like a specimen. It gnaws at me to this day. Did that thing, the first one, deliberately draw me deeper, lead me to the cabin? I reported what I saw. Of course, the police thought I was crazy. I spun some tale of a drug-fueled hallucination, but they didn't fully buy it. The look in their eyes said enough. Maybe a few searched out there deep in the woods. Did they ever find that old cabin? If so, they kept it well hidden. There's no article, no missing person report. Nothing that might explain it all. The official silence tells its own story. Either that, or the figures dealt with anyone who got too close to the truth. This might be my last chance to share this story. They say I have cancer. It's spread pretty badly. Maybe this is a kind of confession, before I go quietly. Or maybe someone with the means, the drive, will read this and decide for themselves. Just remember, sometimes it's better to leave certain mysteries untouched. To walk away while you still can. This happened to me a couple of years back. Now, even telling it feels almost absurd. I'm a city guy, always have been. My idea of roughing it involved hotel room service with less than five stars. Yet there I was, out in some boondock park with my girlfriend, her stupid idea of a romantic anniversary weekend. Let's call my girlfriend Talia. Talia's the granola and yoga type. Found some backwoods RV rental place tucked away online and went on this whole nature detox kick. Turns out this backwoods place was somewhere up in the Appalachian Mountains. Beautiful, sure, if you don't mind the mosquitoes. My name is Ryan, by the way. There were zero other campers the whole weekend, at least none that we saw. 
It was supposed to be serene, just the two of us reconnecting with the great outdoors, yada yada. First evening wasn't too bad. Had a campfire, the works. But something was off. Not like creepy guy behind the tree feeling. It was the sounds. They were different from what you expect in nature. No frogs or crickets, nothing like that. The forest felt dead quiet at night. Night too went downhill fast. Just after sundown, something big crashed through the brush by our RV. We both heard it. Talia swore it was a bear. Me, I thought it was more upright. Sounded too light to be a bear. I poked my head out with a flashlight. Saw nothing. That's when the screaming started. It came from further up the mountain, high and piercing, like a woman caught in something horrible. It shut Talia up quick. We huddled inside for an hour until everything went quiet again. I got some crappy sleep, trying to convince myself it was just wildlife, maybe a mountain lion or something. My dumb city instincts kept saying otherwise. The way the screaming had faded. Like the source of the sound had moved back further up the mountain. Talia refused to budge the next morning. I guess that nature detox of hers wasn't going as planned. I started packing us up, figuring the sooner we got back to civilization, the better. We'd only half-eaten the freeze-dried camping meals on the way out. We had plenty of time, so a detour back into town sounded wise. We figured that would calm Talia down anyway. Worst decision of my life. About five miles north of the entrance to the park, I came around a bend and nearly swerved off the road. Something had been dragged across the asphalt. Blood in this greasy brown mess was smeared everywhere, along with bits, well, Hard to say what they were. I slammed the brakes, heart pounding. Then I saw the shoe. A red women's tennis shoe, covered in mud, lying in the middle of the road. It was then that I truly knew we needed to get the hell out of there. I threw it in and drove like a bat out of hell until we hit the nearest town's outskirts. It took the sheriff a long time to appear. It probably looked ridiculous. City folks, probably still smelling of wood fire, rambling about something they barely saw out in the woods. But he gave us a look, one that told me he'd heard plenty like it before. It's hard to ignore two terrified idiots and a blood-smeared shoe, I guess. He listened intently to my frantic descriptions about the night screaming and the woman's shoe. Folks, his voice was tired. I won't tell you there's nothing. People stuff out in those mountains just disappears sometimes. Don't make no sense. I know what y'all saw wasn't no bear. He patted Talia's shoulder and looked me square in the eye. There are things best not understood. Best to never come back this way, hear me? It turns out we weren't unique. Turns out that was hiker number four that was missing from the last couple of months. They never did find any bodies. I read those newspaper reports months later, the cold chill crawling back as I remembered that lonely shoe in the road. Talia and I split soon after. Nature detox and all that, I guess not every relationship is meant to survive the mountains. There are places the locals don't go for a reason. But that screaming, I couldn't shake it. I kept remembering the way it echoed, moving higher and deeper into the woods. Not even in my worst nightmares can I recreate that sound. Not quite human, not quite animal. But sometimes, just as I begin to drift off to sleep, I think I hear it again, faint and echoing off the concrete walls of my city apartment. That chilling reminder that my worst nightmare could still be out there, waiting. This happened to me a few years ago. 
Now let me preface. I'm a travel journalist by trade. Get paid to see places most just dream of. Sounds sweet, and it can be. But sometimes, assignments take you off the comfortable, beaten path. My name's Reese, by the way. This story has its start back on assignment in Wyoming. Covering one of those under-the-radar state parks. You know the type. Big on scenery, low on visitors. I pitched up one evening in an RV I rented specifically for that kind of trip. I had a bit of extra time thought I might make a bit of a vacation out of it after wrapping the article. It's always a good idea to get the feel of a place by immersing yourself, rather than just whizzing in and out, right? Turns out, I should have whizzed. Night one rolled around and I made the rookie mistake of leaving the RV light on after the sun set. Attracted a cloud of insects I spent an annoying half-hour battling. So the next evening, darkness it was. And it's real darkness out there, none of that weak suburban glow polluting the skies. I fired up the grill, cracked open a beer. Nothing like a cold one by the fire when you have a whole landscape to yourself. It wasn't all sunshine and roses. Got those prickles up the back of my neck once in a while. That feeling like you're being watched even when there's nobody around. But yeah... I pushed it down. City boy getting spooked was all. It was my imagination at play. After all, I could tell a story or two about creepy shadows cast by a flickering, lonely campfire. I tried convincing myself the noises were just critters. Turns out I was way off the mark. It's that primal hum of fear that gets through. It cuts through reason and tells you that, no. Something out there ain't what it seems. By then, the night's silence descended, except for the sound of something rustling around out in the darkness. Not like a raccoon in the trash. Heavier, a slow shuffling noise. I chalked it up to a deer or something and carried on with my dinner. My attention should have been fully occupied I should have listened properly and pieced together the fact that there was something too deliberate in the sounds approaching the RV. I thought to myself, That can't be just one animal making this much noise. Then, there was a bone-chilling shriek half animal, half human. Or to be more accurate, an awful amalgamation of the two. I'm not a jumpy guy, but let me tell you, by then, all the fine hairs on my body were standing on end. It's moments like that when you know, like on a primal level, that you're not alone anymore. It's as if you become prey under the gaze of something unseen. Now let me paint the picture for you. The RV stood just shy of a thick cluster of cottonwood trees. Beyond, rolling scrubland leading to the rising moon. My fire cast a flicker about thirty feet out. After that, pitch blackness. That's where the noise reached its climax. There was crashing and scraping through those unseen bushes right beyond the reach of the light. Every muscle in my body tensed with panic as I dropped my fork, clanging as it hit the grate. And I was inside the RV before I even realized I'd moved. That's when I bolted the door from the inside fumbling in my frantic rush. From my window, I watched those shadows outside. Each one seemed to lengthen in the moonlight, as if twisting into impossible shapes. My heart beat so hard it pounded in my ears. I wouldn't be surprised if you could hear it clear across the campground. That shuffling and grunting drew closer and closer. My eyes narrowed it was time to face this instead of trying to hide from it. Then the figure stumbled further forward, and into the flickering firelight. It was the form of a person, yet somehow off. Too lanky, limbs bent just slightly awkwardly. My hand clamped down on the door lock, fingers numb with fear. Then, in that firelight, its head whipped in my direction. Its face, God, just thinking about it still churns my stomach, pale, drawn, almost as if it were decaying while still living. 
There were features, yet they were distorted, misshapen. But it was the eyes. These soulless pits set back too deep in its face. Just one look, and my gut twisted, churning with that raw animal fear we city folk rarely stumble upon. My fingers fumbled for the ignition keys. Forget this assignment, forget this entire experience, I thought. It took three attempts to get the darn engine to kick over, my hands shaking too hard to get the key into the slot. With a roar, the RV lurched into reverse. With one last glance in the window, pure horror washed over me, the monstrous face pressed against the glass, an unnatural smile splitting its cracked lips. This close, there was an awful stench too, like rotten meat and damp earth. It seemed to burn a hole straight through me. Those horrifying dark eyes followed my movements inside the RV with chilling focus. My foot slammed on the pedal, but I barely registered the impact as it crashed in, slamming right into the side of the vehicle. In those few heart-stopping seconds, I could see something like an oversized claw raking against the door's metal exterior. I heard those horrible wheezing rasps, laced with an almost childlike whimper. Desperation surged through me as I desperately spun the wheel. The vehicle veered violently, shaking the creature as I accelerated frantically on the dusty road. With sickening relief, I glanced in the rearview mirror to see it stumbling and falling on the ground, momentarily defeated. And I did not let off the gas until I left the boundaries of that state park far behind. There were reports to the nearby park office, of course. I tried explaining my bizarre story. I even showed them photographs of the damage left on the side of the RV. But I could see something flicker in their eyes pity, doubt, maybe even disbelief. There were missing person cases too, unsolved, shrugged off as animal attacks or lost hikers. It's easy to brush these things under the rug of normalcy, isn't it? But even writing this out, years later, a tremor runs through me. Whatever that thing was, whatever it's done, it has a reason to stay hidden, festering in that kind of solitude. If that thing was human once, it ain't anymore. No, sir, nature cast it out of its fold long ago. The park authorities probably wrote me off as some kook. The article? Well, let's just say when I sent that draft off to my editor, he responded with, not appropriate. He never gave me a clearer answer, and after what I faced, there was no way I was asking for clarification. My advice? There are reasons some places stay off the map. It ain't pretty out there. But sometimes, just sometimes, it's better left the heck alone. Don't go messing around in parts of the world that have forgotten about us. This happened to me a few years ago. Looking back, the whole thing seems ridiculous, the type of outlandish story they make movies about. Back then, it was pure, cold terror. My name is Kellen. I'm the type of guy who can never sit still. Every weekend, you need to drag me away from my desk, and even then, I prefer doing something physical, rather than sprawling by the pool. If my girlfriend Eleni hadn't insisted on this trip, I'd probably be at home right now, head stuck in some code, not out here battling, well, you'll see. We rented an RV for a week to explore the Badlands National Park. Figured it was a nice balance outdoors, but with creature comforts, which makes Eleni happy. After a long drive, we arrived the first evening. It was stunning, those eroded buttes stretching against a vast canvas of blue. It's easy to feel a bit insignificant out there. I took off for a jog the next morning. Figured I'd kill two birds with one stone, explore and get some exercise. Now, here's where the first part of my nightmare happened. I was going pretty hard, 
a decent distance from the RV, when I came across some bones. At first, I thought it was some unfortunate cow. Then I saw bits of shredded cloth next to the bleached leg bone. And the ribcage wasn't quite right. That's when the knot in my stomach appeared. The shape suggested to me these were human remains. There was no cell reception, a fact I had noticed even the night before. No way to call anyone. My hands began to shake as I took hurried pictures and noted the location on my phone. Now, most sensible people would run back. I should have. But something, it felt important to find more. Stupid mistake. A hundred yards on, my heart lurched. Another. Another twisted form amongst the sagebrush. And another. This was a mass grave. What kind of sick, who could? I muttered under my breath. Fear made my knees feel like jelly, but there was this horrible fascination too. Like that part of your brain that makes you stare at traffic accidents. There had to be some explanation. Panic surged, and with it, an explosion of adrenaline that shot me back toward the RV. I ran until I literally couldn't breathe, then stumbled the rest of the way. Eleni was making breakfast, completely oblivious to what I'd seen. Part of me was tempted to stay quiet, to just pack and go. Instead, I told her everything. She looked horrified, not sure whether to believe me. Eleni's always been more level-headed than I am. When she asked if we should call someone, my stupid sense of urgency kicked in again. It felt wrong to leave this undiscovered. I convinced her the fastest way would be to drive into the nearest town, find a ranger station, and report it. With my hands gripping the steering wheel, I made my way out of the park. We never saw another living soul just that bleak vista that stretched endlessly around us. Finally, on the distant horizon, a cluster of buildings appeared. My relief was short-lived, though. When I stepped into the ranger station, it was empty. Deserted. There was nobody. No note, no indication of where the ranger might have gone. We peered into the adjoining rooms, and it was more of the same no people— just abandoned coffee mugs and papers left sprawled across desks. My skin began to crawl with a kind of unease I've never felt before. Then, we heard a crackle on the radio. Eleni turned towards the sound, her eyes wide. Hello? She called out, a tremor in her voice. I took a step back, the room tilting ever so slightly. An instinctive chill swept down my spine. No voice answered. But what followed? It was worse than complete silence. A steady thump, slow and repetitive, echoing over the speaker. And the scrape of something, something large being dragged against the hard surface. My mind raced back to the bones. A crash made us both jump. We whirled around to see another RV just like ours, smashed against the building, metal crumpled inwards. There were dark stains I didn't want to think about. That's when I saw him. Not the driver, if this thing even had one. It was something tall moving around the corner, something that couldn't be natural. A large frame draped in what appeared to be crudely tanned hides, legs too long, arms awkwardly proportioned. I couldn't see its face, but I knew that thing had looked upon the horror I found out in the Badlands. We gotta go. Now! I choked out, grabbing Eleni's hand. We barreled through the heavy front door, into the bright sunlight that now felt so blinding, so exposed. It felt like moving in slow motion while my pulse drummed a deafening tattoo in my ears. I slammed the RV into gear. Just as the tires screeched on the dirt, something smashed into the rear with the force of a small boulder, causing the entire vehicle to shake. A piercing crack shattered glass on the ground near my feet. 
My hands moved faster than my conscious mind. I shifted into reverse, slamming the pedal. Eleni screamed, clinging to her seat belt. Through the rear window, I caught a glimpse of it again. That hulking shadow with unnaturally long arms, a flash of matted hair, a monstrous silhouette etched against the cloudless sky. It didn't chase us. But maybe it didn't need to. It wasn't until hours later, speeding down the highway with civilization finally starting to reappear, that I dared to check the RV's cameras. My breath hitched. At the far end of the dusty lot, I saw that figure just standing there, watching us leave. Every mile put between us and it felt like a tiny victory. We eventually found another ranger station, reported the abandoned cars, the missing people, even my discovery in the Badlands. The news reports a few weeks later confirmed it, but they never found answers or even a body. I suppose sometimes, it's enough just to survive. The fact that something so monstrous can live off the grid, unnoticed. It chills me to the bone even today. But then I think of all those bones out there, and whatever did that to them, and a sliver of defiance lights up within me. The world still holds dark secrets. That thing didn't take what little courage I have left. I don't know what will, but I sure as hell don't plan on going back to the Badlands to find out. This happened to me a few years back. Reckoning it up now, it feels even more surreal, like a half-remembered fever dream. I'm Kaisen, not exactly what you'd call the outdoors a type. But you get stir-crazy working as a web designer, staring at a glowing screen in your tiny apartment all day. One weekend, an old buddy extended an invite out to his family's secluded cabin up in the Olympic National Forest. Sounded like the perfect escape. Now my buddy Kale has always been a bit peculiar. He's the kind of guy who has his finger on the pulse of the latest conspiracy theory or outlandish internet forum before anyone. The trip up was pretty uneventful. Miles of old-growth forests and winding logging roads. Kale chatted non-stop about strange disappearances reported in the area, something about missing hikers never being found. I tried to humor him. You need patience with that sort of thing when it comes to Kale. After we arrived at the cabin, however, it became harder to be so dismissive. This wasn't the cozy forest hideaway I had imagined. The place had a real sense of unease to it. Walls covered in old news clippings and maps marked up with cryptic symbols, rambling journal entries, faded Polaroid photos. I tried to piece it together it seemed he was fixated on some local urban legend. Kale swore there was a connection between the old tales the indigenous people used to tell, recent disappearances and whatever dark secret he felt had settled over the area. That first evening, after a bit too much cheap beer and Kale's campfire ramblings, something weird happened. I'd woken up around two in the morning. The crackling of the dying fire and a strange humming noise made me step outside. I assumed it was the wind, but it sounded almost melodic. Now, here's where things get blurry. It's like that moment just before a sudden jolt wakes you fully from a deep sleep. Part of me knew it wasn't right, that whatever produced that hypnotic drone wasn't natural. Then the clearing came into view and that's when my memory falters. I know I saw something, a flash of, of what I cannot comprehend. It was all over in a flash. In fact... As the morning came and Kale tried to excitedly pick apart what little I claimed to remember, I started to believe I'd hallucinated the whole thing. Later on, we decided to take his rusty ATV into the woods to explore, to get a break from all the intensity back at the cabin. That's when we found it. An old hunter's shack, 
hidden deep amongst the trees. I felt a cold tingle down my spine my nightmare from the night before seemed to play out right before my eyes. The place showed unmistakable signs of a struggle. Furniture was smashed, clothes strewn around, and dried blood splatters. Something violent had happened here. It wasn't an animal, they're less messy. We called it in. That was as involved as I wanted to be. As I headed back to my apartment a few days later, an unmarked vehicle approached Kale's place before I could leave. Men in suits got out, looking grim. It seemed a couple of hikers had gone missing near where we discovered the shack. It gave me chills because, well, let's just say there were too many weird coincidences stacking up for comfort. Kale, ever eager for vindication, rushed toward the men, shouting something about conspiracies and evidence to back his claims up. They brushed him off, ignoring his desperate pleas. His demeanor shifted quickly as they drove away. Instead of his usual wild-eyed mania, I saw genuine horror reflected in his face. That scared me more than anything else so far. He turned back toward me before going inside, but all he said was a whispered, Don't go back. It seemed less like a buddy's warning and more like a terrified plea. A day later, the police were asking questions about Kale. Not because of the men in the unmarked car, but because he'd also disappeared. I still wonder, was he in danger? Maybe he figured something out, some chilling truth he couldn't live with. Or, the darker part of me whispers, had he become part of whatever shadowed those woods? In all honesty, I couldn't sleep in my apartment for months. It started to feel too suffocating like eyes were always peering in through the windows. Sometimes at night, I catch a hint of that same low, almost rhythmic drone I heard near the cabin. Maybe it's just distant traffic, but the way it stirs that sick panic in the pit of my stomach, it reminds me that those deep woods hide things humans have no place understanding. It reminds me that there are always some questions better left unanswered. This happened to me a couple of years ago. At the time, I was in desperate need of some fresh air. City slicker like me always fantasizes about some quiet, out in the middle of nowhere peace. I'm Elian, by the way. Software developer the quiet, keep to myself type. Figured a few days of solo exploration was precisely what I needed. That weekend, I packed my camping gear into my rusty old 4WD. The drive to the Gifford Pinchot National Forest was uneventful hours of winding highways through dense woodland, getting further and further from civilization. Finally, I spotted the dirt track to a small trailhead campsite. A weathered sign warned about bear activity, but the isolation was the whole point. My campsite was at the far end just me, some gnarled pine trees, and an ancient fire pit. Perfection. That first night, something odd happened. I'd never been alone out in the wilderness like that before. Every twig snap, every rustle of leaves set my mind racing. It felt like something was watching. I brushed it off nerves, right? I'd brought a book— so I huddled up by the fire to distract myself. But as the light began to fade, it began. It started slow, almost rhythmic, like a pebble gently tapped against stone. At first, I figured it had to be my imagination. The next morning, it became apparent it wasn't my mind playing tricks. I found three stones laid out in a neat triangle near my tent. My blood ran cold but logic tried to reassert itself. Could be some other camper marking the path? Seemed like an idiotic thing to do in a place meant to feel remote. Still, I packed up my stuff quick, just in case. 
As I went for a hike deeper into the woods, the sound followed. That same persistent beat against stone, just out of sight. At this point, a part of me knew someone was messing with me trying to scare me away maybe. Then it hit me. Those stones by my tent weren't marking anything. They were a message. It was a game of, what even? Was this some screwed up initiation ritual? I'd read enough news to know there's weird folk hiding out in the sticks. Now, most folks would say turning back there was the smart thing to do. But you gotta understand, even when the fear sets in, I'm stubborn. The woods felt wrong, but I decided to see this through. Figured a good look around for signs of someone living out here would bring peace of mind. By late afternoon, my hunch started to seem less like the stuff of conspiracy theories. A hidden lean-to built under a moss-covered fallen tree. Then a crude snare near a barely visible game trail. I tried not to imagine what, or who, it was for. Fear had settled heavy in my chest by now, but I just didn't want to leave with these unanswered questions. I needed to be sure. I rounded another dense stretch of forest, expecting to stumble upon more evidence. No snare, no sign of further human interference. What I did find was, well, that's where the nightmares start. A clearing with a large fire pit, except something seemed off about those charred rocks ringing it. It took a moment for it to register. Those weren't stones at all. Bones. Human bones, the shapes distorted with fire. Some looked cracked, like something had gnawed on them. I took a few panicked steps back, the tapping sound almost deafening now. Bile was rising in my throat. And right then I saw him. A gaunt figure emerged from the darkness behind the skeletal fire pit. Tall, hunched over, skin stretched tight over ribs like something half-starved had finally found its dinner. It wore what looked like ragged patchwork furs, stained in places with dried blood. Its face. Its face wasn't quite right. Not the face of a normal man. The mouth seemed too wide stretched into an ugly grin that exposed needle-like teeth. It just stood there, silently watching me. This, this creature tilted its head slightly, like it was puzzled by my presence. And then it charged. With an animalistic speed I didn't think possible, it was on top of me in seconds. The tapping stopped abruptly, replaced by a sickening crunch. And that's the last clear image in my mind. I woke up in a hospital bed two days later, a park ranger sitting stoically beside me. I had multiple gashes, two cracked ribs. One I had to be patched up they never managed to explain what caused the bruising near my skull. No trace of anyone else was ever found in the woods. I insisted on my story about that thing. But, of course... They put it down to hallucinations brought on by shock and sleep deprivation. To everyone else, it's an unexplained accident. I know something happened out there, though. Not because of the scars. But because I hear it sometimes, even here in the city. In quiet moments, that damned rhythmic tapping starts up in the back of my mind. They never found those gnawed bones, either. Whatever stalks the Gifford Pinchot, it's still out there. And if it has some strange game it likes to play, well, let's just pray I'm not the next piece. This happened to me a few years ago. Nowadays, when I'm stuck in my cramped cubicle at the office staring down another Friday that won't come quickly enough, it all floods back with startling clarity. I'm Tyro, by the way an engineer by trade. Logical, some might even say a bit overly serious. My girlfriend Anya was the type who wanted to break me out of my rigid existence. So, 
That summer she insisted we escape on an extended road trip with our trusty RV along the stunning California coastline. It was idyllic at first. Miles of ocean waves crashing onto sandy beaches, sunsets I had only ever seen in photographs. Everything changed near Big Sur Anya wanted to camp off the beaten path, so we found a barely marked access road near Pfeiffer State Park. It was beautiful in a quiet, almost unsettling way, giant redwoods crowding the narrow dirt track, casting a permanent twilight even at midday. We set up camp and explored the dense, winding trails with its mossy trees and dappled sunlight barely cutting through the canopy. Even Anya began to admit she might have been too eager to go completely off-grid. Night descended quickly around us. My rational mind knew it was simply because of the forest's thick foliage, but something in the quietness stirred up an undercurrent of apprehension. That's when the smell hit me, carried on a sudden chilly breeze. Metallic and sickly sweet, a wrong sort of smell with no place in the pristine wilderness. The source became evident by the firelight's flicker, a heap of rotting flesh just on the other side of the clearing. My gut clenched. What sort of animal carcass reeked so intensely? And what predator would leave it untouched? Something shifted deeper in the twilight, and before I could react, Anya shrieked. In the distance, there was a shape, large, hulking, half obscured by the darkness. All wrong angles and too long limbs, its movements were jerky, unnatural. My mind searched for comparisons nothing fit. Anya was scrambling backward, eyes wide with terror, whispering a single word over and over. Wendigo, Wendigo. Native American myths, tales of a cannibalistic spirit. Nonsense I never for a second believed. But something was advancing from the depths of that ancient forest, its eyes reflecting the orange glow of our small fire. It wasn't coming for the animal remains. It was coming for us. For once, logic abandoned me. Pure animal instinct surged. I snatched up Anya and heaved her towards the RV with a scream of, Go! 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 She didn't hesitate. The door slammed behind her, and that sickly sweet smell intensified as the thing surged closer. There was a flash of bared teeth, inhumanly long and pointed. No wild animal's growl rose that raw, hungry scream seemed to cut straight through to the bone. Desperation fueled a sudden idea, my point three eight tucked away in the glove compartment. It was no match for, whatever that was, but maybe enough to scare it off if I was lucky. It smashed at the windshield with those oversized hands as I stumbled into the cabin, locking the door with trembling fingers. Precious seconds felt like hours as the creature circled the RV, howling in rage. Its distorted visage slammed against the side window, bloodshot eyes glowing with a predatory hunger. It was relentless. That's when I grabbed the keys, fumbled them into the ignition, and twisted the key. With a roar, the engine sputtered to life. Shifting gears with shaking hands, I threw the RV into reverse, not even sure if there was a path behind me. Branches raked against the sides, and that horrible screech seemed to vibrate in my very bones. Then, a lurch as we slammed into something solid, then another hard jolt. In the rearview mirror, I saw Anya sprawled on the floor scrambling with fear in her eyes. I shouted for her to hold on. This was our only chance. A final crashing impact. We broke through the underbrush, barreling onto the main road. My foot slammed the gas pedal to the floor, adrenaline coursing through every vein. I glanced back those long limbs and gleaming eyes disappeared into the darkness. Had it given up the chase? I refused to take that chance. Miles down the road, just before dawn, we found a rundown gas station. 
The old attendant who stumbled from his back room seemed surprised to see us and eyed the blood spatter on my clothes warily. But that morning, when he asked what it was that came from those thick woods, my only answer was a hoarse choked laugh and, No idea! Anya never brought up the word, Wendigo, again. It became a shared secret, something horrible to be locked away behind the safety of civilization. Do I believe those old folk tales now? No. Not the supernatural sort, in any case. But something malevolent exists in the wilderness, something hidden and cruel, thriving in those spaces humanity has no place venturing. For folks like me, who've always sought solace and predictability and logic, those things lose their iron grip the moment you see your reflection in the starving eyes of something that lives for the hunt. The world is bigger than any of us understand, and perhaps far darker. Some truths are better left undiscovered. This happened to me a couple of summers ago. If I'm being totally honest, the idea probably wasn't the smartest. See, I'm Zeth, a bit of a tech geek, but with a streak of wanderlust. The whole van life thing has always intrigued me. When I got a chunk of my student loans unexpectedly paid off, it seemed like the perfect chance to make my little DIY dream happen. My old man gave me his beat-up camper van to work with, the one he swore held sentimental value from cross-country road trips back in the day. The conversion took most of a stifling hot summer. By August I was itching to head off. I hadn't set any specific destination, just planned to wander south from Oregon in search of something different. I ended up finding different, nestled within Sequoia National Park's dense groves and weathered peaks. There wasn't anything particularly spooky about the area at first. One of those dispersed camping spots where they allow RVs. Peaceful, remote, all those good outdoors of buzzwords. First day was glorious. I hiked alongside giant trees, watched the sun melt behind mountains, made that classic camp meal I never get quite right at home. It felt peaceful, a far cry from my old urban life. So peaceful, actually, that I slept well past sunrise. It was when I emerged from my van the next morning that things took a strange turn. I stumbled out to make coffee and realized that something had been piled neatly at the edge of the clearing overnight. No, not trash, bones. Animal bones of various sizes, stacked into crude shapes. In itself, kind of weird, but also... What's the predator going to do with the ranged leftovers? And the gnawing marks made a chill snake down my spine. No way these were from coyotes. A little rattled, I grabbed my bear spray and started looking for signs, tracks, any evidence of whoever made those morbid little sculptures. Nothing. Not a single footprint out of place. Back at the van... I did what anyone in my shoes would, consulted Google. Turns out some older Native American groups in the region were known to, well, let's just say they had unique cultural practices involving animal remains. It didn't explain the gnawing marks or the distinct feeling that wasn't the whole story. Night fell before I could decide how to proceed. Logically, it made sense to pack up and move on. But another part of me, maybe a foolish part, couldn't quite bring myself to admit defeat so fast. And besides, where would I even go? As darkness crept in, a different sensation began to gnaw at me, a prickly awareness that I wasn't alone. At first, just a rustling of dried leaves or breaking twigs, almost indistinguishable from natural forest sounds. But it gradually got more pronounced, something moving with purpose, circling on the periphery of my vision. That's when it happened. My campfire sparked up a bit hotter, 
illuminating a flash of movement right by the tree line. There stood a man, I think. It was all wrong, though, like some terrible imitation. Too lanky, with limbs oddly angled, almost as though some joints were reversed. I couldn't make out any features, but its head swiveled in jerky stops, locking onto my position. For a brief second, we simply stared at each other. In my gut, I knew there was something unnatural about the way it held itself. That's all it took before my self-preservation kicked in. I bolted for the van, hearing the creature scramble in pursuit. Its ragged breathing grew louder as I fumbled with the keys, hands shaking so badly. The engine rumbled to life, and I slammed the gear shift forward, peeling away from my campsite in a panic spray of gravel. In the rearview mirror, I caught another glimpse of its twisted form slinking in and out of the trees, never giving up chase. I tore out onto the winding park road, not even taking a moment to figure out which direction led out. For all I knew, the creature was still tailing me, cutting through the forest with eerie speed. That was when I hit the turn too hard, too fast. Tires screamed and the van skidded off the narrow road, tumbling down an embankment in a blur of crunching metal and shattered glass. When I awoke, dazed but thankfully alive, the harsh glare of the morning sun illuminated my wrecked van. My rescuers, a pair of concerned park rangers, had to cut me out of the twisted metal. Of course, there was no sign of whatever stalked me the night before. Just an overturned camper and a terrified guy recounting a story no sane person would believe. Now, with the space that time has given me, did I encounter something genuinely supernatural, some creature out of folklore? Or perhaps it was the workings of a deeply disturbed person dwelling out in those dark woods. Either way, it's been enough to turn me into a confirmed hotel guy for the foreseeable future. And let's be honest, a hot shower sounds much more appealing than any campfire-lit adventure right now. This happened to me a couple of years ago. An avid hiker and overall nature enthusiast, I always dragged my less outdoors of friends out into the wilderness for weekends away from the city. This time, it was me, my college buddy Rhett, his roommate Evander, and my ever-patient girlfriend, Brielle. Yosemite National Park was the chosen spot. I know, cliché, but those granite cliffs always leave me in awe. I'm Nash, by the way. I work as a graphic designer, which doesn't exactly contribute to wilderness survival skills, but there you have it. Anyway, with everyone piled into the RV, and my playlist blaring, we hit the road. I won't bore you with the trip details. Camp was set up near a river, overlooking El Capitan Prime Real Estate. We even made some esmores that first night before I crashed early under a canvas of stars. Early morning hikes are my preferred thing. There's nothing like that brisk mountain air before the crowds roll in. The next day, however, something was off. I stumbled upon a discarded campsite, tent still up, backpack open, sleeping bag torn on the ground. There was something strewn about but nothing looked like anyone had packed up and left on purpose. My initial thought was that it might have been some sloppy hikers abandoning their gear. Still, that nagging feeling that something was wrong wouldn't let up. A little further along the trail, I found what looked like a blood stain on a rock. My stomach dropped. The others were still back at camp, none of them the type to wander off before their morning coffee. By now, panic was setting in. I was about to turn back when a sudden movement across the river caught my eye. Someone, a man, I think, was crouched close to the water's edge. 
couldn't make out much except messy hair and a ragged flannel shirt sticking out from beneath a camouflage tarp. Figuring any person right now was potentially a good thing, I yelled out. The man whipped his head up and stood frozen for a second. It wasn't just his look unwashed, disheveled, like someone who'd spent a long time surviving off the land, that startled me. His eyes. They held a coldness I had never seen before in another human being. Before I could think, he vanished into the trees. Something told me the woods weren't safe, not now. Back at camp, I told my friends. At first, they chalked it up to me being jumpy in the wilderness. But then I showed them the abandoned camp and the blood stain. As we looked back at where I'd seen the strange man, we noticed something, off. Something was hanging from the branches. Too far away to tell, but it looked like a pair of hiking boots strung oddly high in the tree. Now, the chilling reality washed over us. Our plan was, naturally, to get out of there. Just pack up and go. That was when we heard it, a gunshot echoing through the valley. Evander was always the quick-thinking one. He yelled, Get in the RV! Don't even pack! I didn't argue. Piled in, engine roaring, we tore down that dirt road faster than should be legal. My girlfriend, bless her soul, had enough presence of mind to call 911, even as I fumbled with the GPS to try and pinpoint our location. It took a while for the rangers to reach us, and once they did, all we could do was give a shaky description of the campsite and the man. There was a search, of course. Hikers always go missing in a vast wilderness like Yosemite, and most times there's a simple explanation. This time, they didn't find anyone. They did, however, find bloody clothing remnants further into the woods, too far from any established trail to be a casual wanderer. Whoever he was, the strange man we saw. I doubt the missing hikers just went off trail. We still hear about hikers going missing in that part of the park now and then. Nobody talks about the wild-eyed man with the empty stare, but I believe that whoever, or whatever, is out there is connected. I try not to think about it, but some nights... I can't help but stare out my window and imagine those cold eyes fixed upon me from the darkness. This happened to me a couple of years back. Now, here's the thing about me, Thad, by the way, I'm one of those preparedness guys. Self-sufficiency, living off the land, not full-on doomsday cult, but hey, a little planning never hurt anyone. That's how I found myself out in the wilderness far-flung corner of the Olympic National Forest, testing my skills with a minimalist camping setup. I figured what better proving ground than those ancient mountains and rugged landscapes, right? It started well enough. First night— I managed to snag a couple of trout from a stream and made a passable fire without too much trouble. Sure, there were some sounds at night branches breaking, the distant call of some animal I didn't recognize, but hey, you expect that in the woods. The real trouble began on the second day. That's when I stumbled onto the signs of another camp. Not an official site with marked trails, but deeper in. There was evidence of someone, an old campfire, half-hidden shelters built from deadfall, and a lot of stripped bones littering the ground. They seemed old no scavengers had messed with them. My survivalist brain switched into high gear. The setup didn't seem temporary. Something had been living there for a hell of a long time. This wasn't just another camper. A wave of unease swept over me. There's the wilderness you expect, and the kind that feels, wrong. Back at my own meager camp, I tried to convince myself that perhaps it was a poacher hideout, or something equally explainable. But with every rustling wind in the trees, 
every snap of a twig echoing eerily through the valley, that gut feeling intensified. I'd stumbled onto someone's territory. By morning, any attempt at rationalization had fizzled away. All my senses were in overdrive, that instinctive part of my brain kicking in and shouting that someone, or something, was watching me from the dark edges of the trees. When I saw a crude spear jammed into the earth near my meager campfire, it was a breaking point. No note, no threat, just a clear mark that I'd been discovered. With trembling hands I packed up what little gear I had, a knot of dread growing in my stomach. As I hiked out, there was this persistent prickling sensation at the back of my neck. Not once did I ever see him, though that didn't mean he wasn't there. It would have been easier to write myself off as crazy, overreacting to some strange hiker or recluse messing with me. But that gnawing terror was like nothing I'd ever felt. Then, as I approached a road, I saw it, the body of an animal, mangled and barely recognizable, and not by any predator I knew. Then the smell of it, acrid and coppery, the stink of iron clinging to the air. That's when I knew the stories whispered of that area might not be mere local lore after all. The locals mentioned disappearances, the odd hunter or hiker simply vanishing. That feeling in the deepest shadows of those forests didn't feel human. The rational side of me wants to think that maybe, just maybe these disappearances were the acts of a disturbed individual pushed too far living in isolation. But I was there. I felt that presence, that unnatural weight hanging in the air. No human is made for that type of wilderness. A park ranger I encountered looked startled by my disheveled, sweaty appearance as I emerged from the tree lean. When I asked about recent disappearances, a strange look flashed across his weathered face for a heartbeat, before he told me it was. Nothing to worry about, son. That these woods had always been. Unforgiving. Later, after a shower and a night in a cheap motel, I tried to search for news reports anything that matched what I'd seen. Not a trace. I considered returning, perhaps with a camera, or better yet, some company. The smarter man in me knows better. There are some secrets we aren't meant to unlock. A month after the ordeal, I still couldn't completely shake that sensation I'd been stalked. Was it a hermit who resented my intrusion? Did some twisted individual take pleasure in preying on unsuspecting victims? Or was I foolish enough to venture into that isolated land just as some folks from an earlier time claimed? Land where old, hungry things waited, their only company the bones of their unwitting sacrifices? It doesn't take monsters with claws and fangs for pure terror to take hold. The worst predators in this world wear plain clothes or perhaps no clothes at all. This happened to me a few years back. Looking back now, it feels like another lifetime. I always like to say I wasn't the outdoors type, but my wife, Lyra, loved to camp. She finally convinced me to go with her as well as my brother, Theron, and his boyfriend, Kellen. A long weekend in the vast expanse of Yellowstone National Park, what could go wrong, right? Let me say up front, nothing about our experience hinted at the horrors ahead. Our trip started the way these things always do. We packed the RV, loaded it up with supplies, and hit the road. Even with my reluctance, the first day went perfectly. The scenic drive kept me occupied, and Yellowstone didn't disappoint. Majestic sights, the powerful scent of pine, and that crisp mountain air, for a moment, I understood Lyra's love for this. We followed the winding park roads, eventually settling on a cozy, quiet campsite near the shores of Yellowstone Lake. Day two is when things got unusual. 
We went on a short hike, enjoyed a tranquil afternoon by the lake, and sat around the fire telling stories under an impossibly starry sky. It was almost too perfect. And as always, perfection doesn't last. I dozed off near the campfire, only to be jerked awake by an unsettling noise. Something snapped just beyond the circle of light. It could have been an animal, but the sound resonated far too loud for a squirrel or rabbit. Theron and Kellen were still awake, staring into the black maw of the forest. You guys hear that? I asked, sleepiness instantly forgotten. We did, Kellen confirmed, his normally relaxed demeanor tinged with an edge of worry. We thought it might be you. Suddenly, we heard a rustling and the undeniable sound of something moving on two legs. Lyra sat bolt upright in her sleeping bag. As her eyes adjusted to the dim light, I saw unmistakable fear mirrored in their depths. Then, a figure stepped out of the forest and into the fire's warm glow. For a long moment, everything froze. Our unexpected visitor wasn't supposed to be there. This was a man six feet tall at least, clad in mismatched hunting gear with dirt clinging to his face. Despite the cold night, he wore no jacket, just a threadbare shirt. His unkempt beard couldn't completely hide the hollow look in his eyes. Howdy, he drawled, his voice surprisingly soft. His gaze didn't linger on any of us, instead flickering nervously around the campsite. Kellen cleared his throat. Can we help you? The stranger shifted his weight, then pulled something from his pocket. I realized with a start it was a knife. Just looking for some food, he said, pointing with the blade toward our cooler. Figured someone wouldn't mind Sharon Dot. His tone was casual, as if asking for a spare cigarette. We can definitely spare some food. Theron said quickly, reaching towards the RV. The stranger tensed, the knife flashing as it caught the firelight. Whoa, easy there. My brother just wants to help you out. The tension broke then. The man relaxed, the knife disappearing back into his pocket. He took a few steps closer, accepted the bag of supplies Theron offered, and retreated back into the darkness. That was all. Then, he was gone, swallowed by the trees. Sleep felt impossible that night. I didn't say it, but I could tell we were all thinking the same thing had this been the start of something more? An isolated incident, or a sign of something far worse? My mind raced through improbable scenarios gleaned from too many crime shows. And the next morning, I discovered I was right. In the cold light of day, something caught my eye, a bit of bloody cloth tangled in a low-hanging bush not far from the campsite. My first guess was an animal got the better of him, but I followed the path anyway, morbid curiosity fueling my steps. I came across a sight I wish I could forget. A pile of bloodied bones, clearly human, was picked mostly clean. Fear coiled in my stomach then erupted into nausea. We weren't the only ones out here. Lyra saw the look on my face as I ran back into camp. When I told them what I found, panic flared in their eyes. We decided to cut our trip short. There was no way we were staying after that. This happened to me a few years ago. Looking back, the whole thing seems ridiculous, the type of tale you brush off with a nervous laugh in company. Of course, at the time, it was far from laughable. I'm a numbers guy, an engineer. Skepticism comes with the territory. Yet, even now, there are questions I can't answer, parts that just don't make sense. My buddy Corin has always been the outdoors type. 
fishing, hunting, you name it. He convinced me to take a summer weekend and go RV camping, just us two guys, some beers, and maybe a fish or two if we were lucky. Turns out he had a spot in mind, the Red Creek Reserve in Utah. Beautiful place. Remote. Not another soul in sight, the way Corin liked it. Red Creek is known for its red soil, a deep canyon running through it, and its old mines from the gold rush era. There's one big abandoned one that's supposed to be dangerous. Locals have their stories about that, of course. The first day was perfect, as perfect as you can ask for with only a tent and an RV parked at the canyon's rim. But somewhere on day two, I noticed something out of the corner of my eye. It was only a flash, the sun glinting off something down below. Then again, there was something moving further down in the canyon, just on the edge of the tree lean. Corin, you seeing this? I pointed but he squinted with a shrug. Probably just a deer or something. His lack of concern emboldened me. Camera in hand, I decided to scramble down a short stretch of the slope for a better look. It wasn't wildlife, that much was clear. Too far off to really say for sure, but the figure looked large, humanoid. I scrambled back to the RV, feeling foolish for venturing down there alone. We joked about Bigfoot, about how ridiculous it all was. Yet, something niggled at my rational mind. It wasn't a bear, the shape wasn't right. I had the strange feeling I was being watched. That night was odd. It wasn't exactly fear that kept me tossing and turning. It was that unsettling feeling, a low prickly awareness that everything might not be as it seemed. I'd woken up once with the distinct sense I'd heard something shuffling just outside the RV. It was quiet enough out there that I should have heard an animal, but there was nothing. I convinced myself it was nerves getting the better of me. Day three is when everything shifted into the realm of nightmare. My name's Ellis, by the way. Ellis Pratt. It started, innocently enough, with Corin going on a morning fish down by the creek. Nothing much was biting, so he figured he'd try a spot further upstream. Told me he'd be back before lunch. That was the last time I saw him. At first, I wasn't concerned. Then the hours started dragging by. Lunch came and went. By mid-afternoon, I didn't know what to think. Maybe an accident? He told me the upstream path got rocky. A tumble, then lost in the trees? It sounded plausible. Until I came across the snap fishing rod beside the creek its end was splintered, the line cut jaggedly. It didn't look like someone breaking it in a fall. It was then I finally felt it, cold, crawling fear. That's when I got the hell out of there left my stuff in the RV, just sprinted back up the path. There was only one narrow road in and out of the reserve. There had to be other people at the trailhead. It was almost dark before I got there, chest heaving, heart pounding. I saw no one. My first panicked instinct was to keep running. Just get as far away from the place as possible. My rational brain wouldn't allow it. What about Corin? I sat in my car, staring into the darkening trees, every instinct screaming. That's when the police siren split the night. Turns out someone reported an abandoned RV matching mine. Routine check, they said. They took me back to the reserve, shown their flashlights around, asked questions. When daylight rolled around, a full-scale search party combed the whole area. Nothing. No Corin, no sign of struggle, no trace of another living thing. Nothing about his vanishing made sense. It was like he had disappeared into thin air. Then, maybe two weeks later, came the package. I came home to find it sitting on my porch, unmarked, no return address. 
Inside the package was Corin's battered camera. An SD card tucked next to the battery hatch. That night, hands shaking, I plugged it into my laptop. I wish I hadn't. There were photos and videos, all from my friends last morning by the creek. Normal stuff at first, him adjusting his line, casting, some shots of the trees, then the change. It started with blurred images, as if the camera was bumped or jerked. Then it stabilized. Corin was running. No, not just running, fleeing in terror. Then the lens caught it for a split second, a man. I say man, but there was something, not quite right. Tall, freakishly so, like Corin was a toy compared to him. Pale skin, almost gray, hair a dark matted tangle. The rest of the video was just the camera tumbling on the ground, pointing up at the sky. Audio continued, though my friend's screams, horrible crunching sounds, then another sound, this low rasping laugh. Like nothing I've ever heard, human or otherwise. And then, abruptly, it cut out. Police took the camera. They checked. No signs of tampering. I described the man I saw, hesitantly. Of course, the officer gave me that half-pitying, half-concerned look. He thought I was losing it. Who can blame him? For months, it consumed me. Every shadow looked like him. Every creaking floorboard was his approaching step. Corin was never found. They eventually declared him legally dead. The official explanation? Animal attack. The thing is, there were two more cases in Red Creek since then. People vanishing without a trace. Always around that abandoned mine, it turns out. Locals talk now. It wasn't just stories from back in the day. That mine, something lives there. Whatever was out there snatched my friend, took the others. I couldn't tell them all I saw, not back then. People don't like to believe in impossible things. But you'll listen, right? Sometimes, late at night, I take out the camera and watch just the first moments of that video. That first glimpse of something inhuman lurking in the trees. Some twisted part of me replays those sounds, trying to decipher another word behind the laughter. To me... It wasn't the sounds Corin made that were most haunting. It was the thing that ended them. There was amusement in that inhuman rasp, the amusement of a game well played. Maybe that's what it is to him, out there in the deep dark woods. Just a game. This year, I might go back to Red Creek. Alone. People will think I'm crazy. They'll try to stop me. I have to, though. To see if maybe, just maybe, there's more to find. Something on that video I missed. Or maybe not even on the video. I keep thinking back to that flash of movement the day before. The light glinting off something at the tree line. The last thing I want is proof. Some bone to give them. Evidence they can dismiss or deny. They won't get any of that from me. Corin didn't get a body to take home. All I want is some small thing to explain why it happened, an answer. I know, logically, it won't change anything. He's gone. But this, this gnawing uncertainty, this fear that somehow, he could have made it out there, could be alive and in need of help. If I find nothing, a clean ending to this twisted tale, that's what will finally finish me. Because if all these disappearances in the same small place are merely random acts of nature, then well, it seems the world is far darker and scarier than even a crazy tale of a lurking inhuman thing. This happened to me a few years back. Honestly, I'm never keen on going camping. But when your cousin invites you on a road trip through some of the national parks on the west coast, it's tough to say no. 
Besides, he was bringing my best friend from middle school. Call me Jonas, by the way. I always wanted to travel like this for real, just pile in an RV and cruise down those iconic desert highways. I thought it would be an adventure filled with postcard-perfect scenery and late-night card games. You know, classic road trip stuff. Sequoia National Park was our first stop. It felt magical driving through tunnels cut into those trees so massive they dwarf human existence. We set up camp, rented out some hiking gear, and planned out a route across the backcountry, one with a couple of overnight stops along the way. Our destination was this lesser-known lake. Some local guy at the ranger's station hyped it up, said there were spectacular stargazing views. My cousin Zane thought it'd be fun, said a little adventure was good for us city folk. I wasn't so sure. Day one on the trail went fine. Some spectacular sights, maybe saw a bear from a distance. Even made friends with another young group of hikers heading the same way. That feeling of camaraderie among folks heading into the wild always gets me. Nights when things got unsettling. We had the campsite to ourselves. Fire blazing, we cracked open beers and swapped stories until all that was left was the sound of crickets and a rustling breeze. I remember the stars, a million of them, and thinking I didn't need that fancy lake after all. Morning was another matter. We found our supplies half gone, food containers ripped open, boots scattered by the stream. Our new hiker buddies had a similar scene back a mile where they'd camped. They said it must have been an animal, or some really inconsiderate campers who hadn't packed up properly. My friend, Emmett, seemed less convinced. He was the always be prepared, kind. Still, with nothing missing save those protein bars no one wanted anyway, we figured it was an isolated thing and pushed on. Night two? That's when I knew we had a problem. I woke up to a noise. We'd camped in a small clearing this time, a sliver of moon slicing through the pines. Someone, or something, was circling our tents. Every few paces, I'd hear it, the crunch of leaves, a branch snapping. This wasn't an animal. I could feel eyes on me, peering through the tent fabric. Panic woke up Zane and Emmett. I whispered that we needed to move now. Our friends from the first night bolted just as dawn lit up the sky. Zane wanted to go, find this person, whoever it was, confront them. I told him I wouldn't risk getting shot out there. In the back of my mind was an annoying question the others hadn't voiced. Why mess with our food but leave everything else, the expensive gear, wallets, phones? Nothing about scavenging seemed to fit. Zane was adamant then that we report it to the rangers. The station wasn't too far back on our route. We were halfway there when everything turned to chaos. Gunshot echoed through the trees, then screams our hiker friends. All four of them ran from the woods, yelling they needed help. Another shot, another shout, then only two hikers returned, tears streaming. No time to explain. I yelled them into the RV, Emmett already behind the wheel. We tore down that dirt track like something was chasing us. Which, well, it may have been. It's strange because, in the rearview mirror, we didn't see anyone emerge from the forest. That, I think, is scarier than any gun-toting maniac. That silence, after what could have been murder. We alerted the rangers when we hit cell service. They looked at us like we had three heads, said no reports matched our story. I gave them detailed descriptions of our campsite, the direction of the shots, everything. Nothing. Eventually, Zane started wondering if I'd imagined it during some nightmare in the woods. The missing, or maybe dead, campers were never located. I haven't gone camping since, not out in the wilderness anyway. You might call me paranoid, 
but those rangers had seen this before. Look up those missing person statistics for national parks. Some don't have any explanation. It's never an animal, they always say. Sometimes I feel a prickle up my neck, like maybe I'm still somewhere out there in the woods, still being watched. This happened to me a few years ago. Now, here's the thing about me. I never liked RVs. There's just something about them that always rubbed me the wrong way. They feel cramped, plastic, and let's be honest, most of them come with some truly terrible interior design choices. But my fiancé, Alara, was desperate to visit some of the smaller national parks out west. It's what she called our Grand Tour, where we would try to pack in as many parks as possible over a three-week stretch. My name's Ishan, by the way. That first week went surprisingly well. We picked up the RV in Phoenix and worked our way up through Zion and Bryce Canyon in Utah. It was the remote stuff that excited Alara the kind of winding roads that take you deeper into the landscape until even the cell signal gives up the ghost. We found ourselves a pull-off in a corner of Capitol Reef National Park, surrounded by these massive sandstone cliffs glowing in the late afternoon sun. I'm not going to lie it was spectacular. We cooked under the awning, and I even admitted that yeah, maybe those awful paisley interior cushions had their own kind of charm in this light. The moment was broken by a tapping at the driver's side window. Standing there was an old man, looking weathered and disheveled like he'd spent weeks camping without a bath. He gave us a hesitant smile, said his truck ran out of gas a few miles back, and could we be a good Samaritan to give him a ride to the ranger station? No phone service up here, of course, and his old knees weren't up for the hike. My first instinct was a, no, there was something, unsettling about this guy. But Alara jumped up, insisted this was exactly what this epic, van life, road trip was all about, helping folks, you know? Besides, he needed our help. And he climbed, the van filling with a musty odor that wasn't there before. The guy hardly spoke while we turned back for the main road. I noticed he kept touching his faded camouflage backpack, like whatever was inside held something precious. I glanced at Alara, caught her worried expression reflected back at me. He directed us back, further on a dusty dirt road I swore wasn't even marked on our map. Said there was a shortcut, knew these hills like the back of his hand. After what felt like hours, we arrived not at a ranger station, but an abandoned campsite with crumbling brick fire pits and what looked like an overgrown shack hidden on the far slope. My gut told me to put the RV in reverse, leave this dude in the dust, but Alara was already halfway out the door offering him water. Something just snapped in me then. Okay, that's enough, I yelled, probably louder than needed. Thanks for the ride, this guy muttered, slipping down from the cab with his bag tucked tight underneath his arm. That's when I saw the knife tucked into his belt. Let's see what's so important, I told him, stepping closer. There was a struggle, brief but enough to feel his strange strength fueled by desperation. Elara screamed, I stumbled back, and well, then it got really bad. It's still hazy, all those moments between my fall and seeing them both run up a narrow track into the hills and out of sight. By some miracle, I was able to find the main road after what must have been hours of walking. Park rangers had arrived, searched all day for Alara. The place felt cursed, that hidden camp swallowed by the shadows of the surrounding cliffs. In the back of my mind, I couldn't shake the image of them both vanishing into the distance, swallowed by the vastness of a wild space I never should have entered. Alara still listed as missing. 
There were rumors about other lost hikers. The cops muttered something about hermits up in those hills. But they found nothing solid during their search. Every so often, late at night, I think I see the glow of an RV headlight from my apartment window. A cruel trick of the street lamps. Some nights, I find myself mapping out the parks from our trip, remembering every twist and turn. Logically, I know what happened was something human, explainable. A man desperate enough to use the ruse of a broken-down truck, a remote spot, and an overly trusting traveler. That's how it must have gone. Yet, every time I close my eyes, all I see is Alara vanishing into the wilderness. All I feel is the memory of that musty smell of dried pine needles and something deeper, older, unyielding. This happened to me a couple of years back. Now, here's the thing about me. I love a good adventure. Hiking, fishing, you name it. Throw in a touch of exploring some uncharted wilderness, and you've sold me. That's how I found myself convincing my sister, Brinley, and our college friends, Kellen and Theo, to embark on a trek into the remote backcountry of the Olympic National Forest. They're more about beach vacations, if I'm honest. Brindley even tried to bribe me with tickets to some music festival I vaguely remember hearing about. I'm stubborn that way. My name's Flint, by the way. Olympic is all that old-growth rainforest magic. Towering trees dripping moss, ferns as big as your kitchen table. You know the type of place. That first day went better than expected. The trail took us to a quiet stream, where we set up base camp. No one else in sight. After throwing up tents and cooking over a campfire, we settled in to swap stories and soak up the solitude. Now, this is where it starts to go sideways. Mid-evening, Brindley swears she heard movement coming from a stand of trees nearby. I brushed it off. Wind-blown branches or some curious squirrels, probably. Then, Theo mentioned that while fetching water earlier, he could have sworn he saw eyes watching him from a distance. He's kind of jumpy at times, and the others gave him a hard time. Still, a flicker of unease went through me, too. It wasn't fear, not just yet anyway. Maybe call it intuition. Or just being in the wild and feeling small in the face of the forest. Night settled in heavy. I dreamed of dark shapes shifting on the edge of sight, just shadows playing tricks with my mind. I'm a heavy sleeper, usually, but I awoke suddenly. Kellen sat wide-eyed on the edge of his tent, gesturing for me to be quiet. A rhythmic scraping sound echoed outside. Brindley began calling my name in a strained whisper from her tent. There was a figure hunched in the darkness, maybe eight feet from where we lay. All I could make out was its ragged shape against the faint moonlight. This couldn't be an animal. It was upright, moving on two legs. In its hands, in its hands, it held one of our knives. I'll never forget that chill, the sudden clarity that this wasn't just someone stumbling on our campsite. This was deliberate. Theo fumbled for the bear spray on his belt, hand shaking. The creature tilted its head towards us like an alert bird. We didn't hesitate. I threw our pack of food in one direction as a distraction, the knife-wielding figure moving to pounce on it. We tore across the campsite, fumbling through underbrush, desperate for an escape route. It wasn't much of a plan— but it was all we had in that heart-pounding frenzy. Running blind in that kind of forest is madness. Every tree root seemed to reach out in the dark, every branch aimed right at your eyes. It felt like ours, but when we burst breathless onto a deserted logging road, it was an oasis in the chaos. Luck, 
a lone hiker's truck parked next to an overgrown side trail. He was packing up after some night photography, saw us stumble out, eyes wide like spooked animals. The cops got a statement, then drove us straight to the nearest ranger station. We spent the night in those uncomfortable chairs, listening to a radio playing crackling static and trying to catch slivers of sleep. The cops looked confused as we tried to describe our strange stalker. There weren't any homeless camps around there, nothing to even indicate why some hostile person would be out in the middle of nowhere armed with a stolen kitchen knife. They said it could have been some transient, someone unstable who drifted that way. It never clicked that this was, well, the point where you don't go into the woods again on your own. They searched, of course, and found nothing. Now, the thing that haunts me isn't that initial terrifying night. It's what came after. We discovered photos were missing from Theo's camera, shots he swore he took while hiking earlier that day. Photos no one else remembers seeing. We didn't talk much about it. There's a point where your sense of logic battles with the terror ingrained deep in your bones. Eventually, life goes on. A few months back, the news carried a report about a hiker gone missing in the Olympics. Not all that unusual, sadly. Then, they showed his photo and something inside me went cold. I'd recognize that camera around his neck anywhere. Could be nothing, a coincidence. I like to think that's it. I have to think that's it. Sometimes, when walking at night, a sliver of unease sets in. Something seen out of the corner of the eye, a shadow slipping along the edges of the street lights. It's then I remind myself it's the city now, not the dark woods. There's nothing here now, I tell myself. Nothing at all. This happened to me a few years back. At the time, I worked a soul-sucking corporate job with hours that left me little time for actual life. Sarah, my wife, convinced me I needed a vacation. I didn't agree. What were a few days away going to change? Still, after much nagging, I grudgingly put in for time off. Our travel options with such short notice were limited. Flights anywhere fun were exorbitant, but a couple named Blake and Amelia on an RV rental site were practically giving theirs away on short notice. I'd never driven that big of a vehicle, but it seemed easy enough. Sarah booked it before I could object further. Maybe some fresh air and time outdoors would be what I needed after all. Our destination was decided for us too. Blake and Amelia suggested Sequoia National Park in California. They offered glowing references, stunning trails, towering trees, the whole bit. And the idea of spending time near those gargantuan sequoias did pique my interest. It promised to be something unique. I'm Evan, by the way. We picked up the RV on a scorching summer afternoon. Inside was nicer than I expected— all cozy and well-stocked. After a crash course from Blake on operation, we were hesitantly on our way. Sarah drove first. That alone took some edge off my tension. Sequoia was amazing. I admit, seeing those ancient, massive trees brought something close to all. We spent two days wandering trails, losing signal on our phones, cooking dinners outdoors on the little campsite stove. There was laughter. That felt weird. We were happy, or at least as close to it as I'd been in years. I started to understand what Sarah meant about finding myself again. My corporate worries slowly drifted away. Day three, that's when things turned. We'd tackled a strenuous hike early, returning to the campsite exhausted. I took over the wheel for the short trip to our next site while Sarah made lunch. About halfway there, 
I noticed the truck pulled off behind a grove of trees, maybe a quarter mile down the road. Nothing weird, right? People stop. But in the rearview mirror, I saw someone step out from behind those trees. Tall guy. Thin. Binoculars in his hands. At first, I thought he was a bird watcher. Then it hit me. Sarah was making sandwiches in the back. He couldn't see her. My gut twisted. Something wasn't right. Evan, the view up here is beautiful. Pull over. Sarah called out. My foot hesitated over the gas. That guy didn't feel like a bird watcher. Not the way he moved. Not the way he held the binoculars. I didn't answer Sarah. Just pushed down harder on the accelerator. It wasn't much but I was glad the RV had some pickup. My hands clenched the wheel tight. Evan? Why aren't you, oh God? Sarah had spotted him too in the side mirror. Panic set in. A mile past our turn, there was a small rest area. I skidded into it, my heart pounding against my ribs. We slammed the doors shut, locking them in a single motion. Sarah huddled up against me, and we could feel rather than see his truck rumble past. He didn't stop. We stayed there, breathless, for what felt like hours. He wasn't after us, I told myself. Just a coincidence. He wasn't coming back. But my mouth was dry with fear. That night, Sarah and I barely slept. Every creak of the RV... Every rustling branch put us on edge. I wished I'd brought a gun, or learned hand-to-hand combat. Hell, anything to feel something less than helpless. Sarah kept asking if we should head home, and a voice told me she was right. Yet a stubborn defiance, and the guilt of ruining her long forgetaway, kept me from agreeing. Next morning, everything was unnaturally still. The air buzzed with wrongness. I had this sick feeling in my gut, a certainty that he was out there. Watching us. Just waiting. I finally agreed to drive, my grip on the steering wheel so tight my knuckles went white. At the first ranger station, we burst in, desperate to report what happened. Their faces were a strange mix of confusion and pity. You see folks disappear. Happens every year, the older ranger said with a resigned sigh. People, sometimes they want to start fresh elsewhere, or they think they can live off the land with no plan. Some accidents out there, too. Terrain gets rough. But we saw. Sarah tried to argue, then trailed off. Of course, they wouldn't believe us. It sounded crazy, and frankly... I was starting to have my doubts about how real yesterday even was. Stress can play tricks on the mind. This happened to me a couple of years back, right around that time in life when weekend getaways with the guys just started feeling routine, you know? Still fun but less of an adventure. Name's Noah, by the way. Used to be a bit of a city rat, noisy apartment, take out every night, till work stressed me out so bad I had to make a change. Got into hiking, biking, all that healthy nature stuff. Figured why not try an actual camp out for once? My buddy Declan, bless his adventurous spirit, found this awesome website claiming to list. Undiscovered camping spots. The one that caught our eye was a secluded clearing deep in the Ozarks, Missouri side, near a winding river. No crowds, no park rangers, no nothing. Just us and the open skies. Sounded too good to be true to this city boy, but I was up for it. It was a long drive in Declan's beat-up old RV, packed full of supplies. It took longer than we thought to get to the remote access road, and even by then, 
The sun was fading fast. Should have called it a night right there, but the call of the wild and all that. There was a rough clearing just barely big enough for the RV, surrounded by these gnarled pine trees. Didn't take long to set up camp, a few folding chairs, basic supplies out. Declan insisted on messing with his telescope while there was still some light. Me, I wanted to push ahead, do some exploring. The website mentioned a trail system nearby. It's funny how quickly ambition fades when the light disappears and the woods loom over you. That's when I started to think maybe staying near the RV wouldn't be so bad. Declan laughed at me, but even he must have felt it, that nagging chill that wasn't the evening air. I head off down a worn path, phone flashlight flickering uselessly against the trees. Shouldn't have gone solo, should have waited for daylight but that familiar craving for a little exploration got the better of me. That thrill of being away from it all, from work, routine, noise, people. The first half hour goes fine, just the gentle creaks you expect from the forest. And then, I see it. At first, it's just a lean-to propped against a massive oak, but there's something off about it. Fabric too old and worn for any modern camper, branches propped too tight against the tree like it was built as a makeshift shelter and left untouched for ages. That's when it hits me, an iron tang in the air, the stench of rotting meat. There are clothes strewn across the ground, tattered and muddy, some soaked in dark splotches I don't even want to imagine. And right next to that makeshift camp, something large, wrapped in ripped dark canvas, something still. I should have run then, called for Declan, anything. But there's a morbid curiosity burning within me, the need to figure out what the hell happened here. I inch closer, phone beam catching at the canvas tarp, and that's when I notice the boots peeping out. Now, this is where my brain and body disagree. The sensible part yells, Get out of there! The other part just freezes can't speak, can't move. It's as if every part of me knows there's danger nearby, but my fear is too overwhelming to do anything except stand there gawking. The boots don't budge. There's no breathing, not even the rise and fall of a chest. Finally, something clicks. That body was dead for sure, the smell overpowering now. Something, or someone, left him and whatever other poor souls set up camp here to rot. My mind races through all the stories I'd heard about folks mysteriously disappearing in national parks, and suddenly I am running through those trees, legs screaming, flashlight bobbing wildly. It feels like it takes forever, but then I see the glimmer of our campsite ahead. I burst through the trees, yelling for Declan. I stop short. He's staring through his telescope, perched on his camping chair like nothing is wrong. You gotta see this, Noah, he points upward. Orion's right. Suddenly, he notices the wild look in my eyes. I gasp, trying to get words out, and point wildly back at the trees. Declan finally jumps off his chair, confused. Then, from what felt like right behind us, comes a blood-curdling scream. It's not human, and it's definitely not an animal I've ever heard. There's a rustling nearby, snapping branches, something moving at impossible speed. We both just stare, paralyzed. There's another scream, and in a flash, Declan turns and bolts for the RV. My body finally kicks into gear, and I run right behind him. No fancy plan, just a desperate scramble into that rickety RV. I barely make it through the door before I hear a thump against the side, metal groaning, followed by that screech again. Declan slams the gas pedal, lurching us backwards enough to throw me on the floor. My head hits hard against the cabinet, blurring my vision for a second. It takes every ounce of strength to pull myself up. When I can finally focus, 
I see Declan peering frantically out the windshield. I scramble beside him, and we both gasp at the same time. There's a man standing near the edge of the clearing. Tall, emaciated, and clothes barely hanging off him. His skin seems gray in the faint moonlight, and his eyes, they glow an unnerving amber color, fixed on the RV. It's hard to make out details through the streaked glass, but there's something unsettlingly animalistic about the way he hunches, almost predatory. It's like he knows we're looking, senses us staring with absolute terror. I hear a scratch against the door, fingernails or something else sharp and bony. Another horrifying scream echoes through the woods. Then, Declan's shaking hands manage to put the RV in gear and he guns it out of there, tires spitting dirt and gravel. My head swims, blood trickling from where I hit the cabinet, but I don't dare take my eyes off that terrifying figure in the flickering headlights. He doesn't give chase, just stands there watching us perfectly still as we speed off into the dark. For a terrifying moment, I think maybe we're safe after all. We manage to make it back to the rough access road, where that sliver of civilization brings me some small shred of hope. Then, from somewhere in the dense trees beside the road, the screaming starts again. There's another loud shriek and we hear a crash just moments before something massive leaps onto the roof of the RV, metal screeching, fiberglass crunching. Declan swerves madly, nearly tipping us into the ditch. Whatever it is on our roof, it's heavy, clawing at us, ripping into the vehicle like a starving animal. We don't stop, I barely even take a breath. Declan floors it, tires spinning and kicking up mud, there are thuds against the sides, bone against metal, more of those inhuman cries slicing through the night. I try to look back, see what's attacking us, but the forest flashes past too quickly in the dim light. The RV starts to fill with an awful stink, the same rotting smell from the campsite. Finally, after what feels like forever, we hit the main road. It feels like freedom. Like maybe... Just maybe, we made it out. We don't slow down until we see the lights of a highway rest stop, and only then do we dare to pull over. The damage to the RV is extensive, deep scratches running the length of it, windows cracked and leaking. My heart throbs at the idea of what we barely escaped. We barely speak until we find a gas station and stumble inside to call the police. They don't find anything out there, except some ravaged campsites and scattered personal effects. The look on the officers' faces speaks louder than words. After that, the drive home is a blur. Neither of us really want to talk about what we saw. Every dark shadow along the highway sparks the same terror. Even after I shower and lie awake in my own bed, I imagine the smell following me. Imagine those glowing eyes burning into me from the corner of my room. Declan doesn't respond to my texts or calls. The news whispers of missing locals, disappearances explained away vaguely as animal attacks. I know better. We both know better. It's become hard to find peace in the outdoors. I still take hikes, forced by some sense of routine, but I never stray far from the trail. There's a voice in the back of my head reminding me that darkness hides more than just unseen roots and unseen rocks. That somewhere out there, just beyond the edge of human understanding, that man and whatever attacked us still exist. The wild doesn't seem so adventurous anymore. 